Welcome to tonight's stream. And uh, <laughs> this is this is going to be a lot of fun, I believe. Um, so we recently uh, turned a thousand uh, thousand subs subscribers, and in um, celebration of that, I thought, why don't I do something a little bit different? So, if you don't know, uh, my like uh, it's sort of my day job now mm -hmm. I'm still doing freelance work and stuff but a lot a lot of my time now it goes into teaching at a university where I teach music production and for the last six months I've been trying to do a um, an online course uh, for that university and since I already made every every everything every note every assignment everything in Norwegian uh, I thought why don't I try to do it in English in a different program live <laughs> so that's that's the plan for today <clears throat> and we'll see how that goes um, and if you if you're seeing this afterwards then uh, one tip uh, that, that I use a lot on YouTube uh, if if someone's doing anything live or is not a native English speaker like me, uh, then uh, it might be cool to um, to do uh, uh, like a, a speed up the the playback. Obviously, you can't do that live, but uh, Ritesh, Anitesh, hello from Sri, Sri, Sri Lanka. That's awesome. All right, so uh, we'll just get started, I think. Um, music production is a really big topic, and the the unit that I teach at university is uh, very small. So it's maybe one-sixth uh, of what the students are going to learn that semester. <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, we're going to go through uh, like a introduction to music production but we're gonna cover a lot of different topics like uh, like the theory a little bit of theory about music production about sound about microphones uh, all that kind of stuff and then we're gonna move into actually making some making something out of this so uh, that's it I'm gonna try to translate all of this from Norwegian to English as we go uh, and and hopefully my kids won't uh, make too much noise they're soon going to bed so <laughs> so hopefully that's gonna be nice I'm just gonna check whether or not uh, the scenes are working the way they should yeah it looks like that is good so I'm just look at myself you know uh, and there we go. So this is my desktop. <clears throat> All right. So first things first, uh, we're going to talk about Cubase today. Cubase. And so first thing uh, you ought to do if you'd like to learn this in Cubase is to try to get Cubase. And this is the website. You can do download a trial version uh, and try this for 30 days. So uh, if you'd like to follow along, then go through the steps and create an account and download everything uh, that's done through the Steinberg Download Assistant, which looks like this. He said, uh, apparently I need to update it to... to run it so let's do that as well auto updating obviously there's a lot of different programs one could choose um from from my students i i can see that a lot of people are using logic nowadays uh there's uh, i think there's a uh comparison there's a LE is that the free version? Mm -hmm. Elements, and then there's Cubase AI and Cubase LE. 
And I think these come from software. Like if you buy a uh, an audio interface, you you get one of these. There's pr they're pretty limited. You can have a, like eight instruments, eight grid channels, only for insert slots. But this is way better than, for example, Avid's uh, free version. Yes, it seems like. Try Cubase Elements. Okay, so if you want the Cubase Pro trial, you will need the USB E licensor, although that is subject to change. Um, there's rumors of Steinberg uh, changing the way they they, they do the, their anti anti piracy piracy stuff. So <clears throat> um, if you're watching this after the fact, then things might have changed. So there you go. Uh, okay. But I already have uh, Cubase Pro 11, which is the latest version uh, installed. And I'm just going to give up on this, I think. This usually works. Um, I'll, but of course, when I'm streaming, nothing, nothing is working. So Windows stuff, you know. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. So... Um, I am just going to double click it. So after you've installed it, you'll have to run it. And the first time you run it, uh, it's going to take a, a lot, lot longer than it's going to do, uh, than it's going to take usually. And that is just the program uh, getting set up and testing uh, various plugins. If you have plugins from uh, third party uh, companies, <clears throat> although if you're just learning music production, um, that uh, is, is not important at all. We can use, uh, and I think today we're going to use mostly stuff that is um, stock. Stock plugins means plugins that um, follow the, the program. So <clears throat> you don't need to buy anything else if you've done the investment of going through buying Cubase, which is not a um, not a small investment by any stretch of the imagination. Yuvogin, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Let me see. <clears throat> so, um, usually I like to talk a little bit about, let me, let me just grab a uh, interface. So, if we go back to the main camera, here is an audio interface, uh, and we use a lot of these at uh, the university because they're pretty uh, cheap and they sound awesome for the price. So these are the uh, Focusrite Scarlett uh, interfaces. They are sturdy in the metal housing and very easy to use. If you're on a Mac, these will not need a, uh, a driver of any kind. It will just work out of the box. If you're on Windows, you'll need to download a driver. So <clears throat> make make sure you do that. Uh, I can tell you are like between 20 and 60 years, 60 years old. Yes, somewhere in between there is true. <laughs> All right. So um, this is the brains of the audio when you're working uh, with a digital audio workstation. And, and this little box will do a lot of different things that whenever you um, invest in, in proper studio, uh, studio grade equipment, usually these will be different boxes that do different things. So when we connect a mic, to uh, uh, like a this input right here, and we turn this knob, then we're working with the preamp of the audio interface, 
and after that it's going to go through a series of um, converting that signal from an analog signal to a digital signal so that the computer can read that uh, read that audio and so that we can affect it with an with an EQ or uh, add some reverb to it and do a lot of different stuff and then afterwards the opposite will happen so we'll convert that signal that comes from Cubase uh, back into an analog signal and in my case play that audio uh, in a headset <clears throat> yes I agree the focus right stuff is really really good uh, all right so finally Cubase is up and going and as you guys can see this is what will meet you and obviously you won't have any project in your recent folder I will have uh, lots because um, I, I will <laughs> I'm doing stuff <laughs> and and um, it's it's not my first time opening Cubase luckily for you guys uh, and so you, you get a d different kinds of places to start from and we call these things templates I love templates and I love building templates and in my daily work as a, like a media composer or mixing engineer I use templates a lot and it, it helps me uh, save a lot of time basically however uh, for this thing, we're just going to start with an empty project, and in the this dialog, you can you can kind of uh, you can choose the default location, which means that the projects will always uh, get saved in in the same location. I don't like that. Um, if you did, then you could specify the folder name, and it, it would create a new folder, which which is pretty nice. But I always like to kind of know. Where I'm saving stuff and I also like to have my project on a separate drive that just kind of alleviates some pressure um, so that the computer uh, like I'm thinking of it this way like the the app uh, runs from one hard drive and then all of the source files will run from another drive and I think that's a good good practice and it's also great um, if, like if your main OS drive uh, fails, then you'll still have your project files. Unless there's a fire or something horrible happens, <laughs> right? Okay, so I, I'm just gonna navigate to my folder. I have a full, I like a, a place called current projects and we'll create a new folder. We'll say music production in Cubase. And, and go into that 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 folder basically, all right. And then I'll create another folder uh, and and say my first song. Now this is a little different from program to program. I've worked a lot in different programs, and and usually I do this course in Pro Tools. Um, and Pro Tools will create the the folder when when you specify the project name is going to create a folder with that uh, name. Cubase works a little differently, so it doesn't do that. Uh, so I, I need to make sure to create that folder myself. All right, so do that and I say select folder. And here we go. This is now a project. Uh, and this is Cubase. <laughs> so this might be a very overwhelming, which I can understand. There's a lot of things that I almost never use uh, in what you see here. Uh, and, and then there's some stuff that I use always and every day. I'm just gonna, what is, there's, there's a black window. Something is, something is running, but it shouldn't. Hmm. Okay, we'll see, uh, we, we will probably need to uh, to use an, uh, the, the screen that you're not seeing right now. Well, well, you are kind of seeing it. Uh, <laughs> but I can, I can hide it. So let's see. There we go. So now it's gone. <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is 
QBs. And if you have a look up here, it says untitled ones. Right now, the project is not saved, uh, which means that if I start to record audio, then it's going to save that audio in a, in a temporary spot. And all sorts of, of issues can start to happen, if especially if we move files from one uh, location to another. So the first thing that I always do is to uh, hit Control S or Command S and save that project. And I'm just going to name it the same as my folder. So my first song, and I also add a, like a version mark to everything that I do because that is uh, helpful. Okay, so <clears throat> what is a digital audio workstation? It's a place where we can. Um, import audio, we can record audio, or we can record uh, software instruments with a MIDI keyboard. And we're going to get to that as well. Um, and we can mix and match all of those different sources and export out audio from um, this program. So it's, it's really, really helpful. And Reading messages from from the wife is always important. It's always important. All right. Let me see. So we've opened the program. We talked a little bit about uh, the licensing and stuff, or a very little bit. Um, so, uh, like I said, it, it's probably going to change very soon. What you, what you need of like physical dongles in order to run this thing, and um, we had a question if if the program is free. Uh, or, or if there's a free version of it, I believe there is. Uh, and at least there's a month of trial uh, if you if you'd like to check it out. So that's done. So I'd like to talk a little bit about this whole screen. If we have a look at it, there's uh, uh, things might not make too much sense uh, the way it is right now because. Uh, some of these panels will populate themselves once we add uh, add some tracks. So maybe we should do that. Maybe we should add a track. Um, the default key command for adding a track in Cubase is actually the, the, the button T. But I believe I've changed it. So it doesn't work for me. Um, but I can right click in this panel over here and say add an audio track, for example. Let's try to add an audio track. If we do, this dialog appears and we can specify what, where it would, we would like to, uh, to, to get that audio from, what physical input on the uh, interface we would like to get that audio from, uh, if, if it's gonna be only one signal or if it's gonna be two signal. If it's one signal, uh, this, it will be a mono track. If there, if there was two signals, we would probably add it as a stereo track. And also we can add some other uh, configurations, uh, which we're not going to talk about in this course. Um, so I, I say most of the time we would add them as a stereo track. Uh, I'm trying to think of examples, like if you would like to record uh, two separate things with two different mics, would you add it as a stereo track then? Probably not, uh, because a stereo track, uh, the, the default behavior of the stereo track would be that signal one would go to the left speaker and signal two would go to the right speaker. And if you're recording two different sound sources, that wouldn't make a lot of sense most of the time. Uh, so when would you like to record in stereo then? Um, if you're recording a stereo source, so if you're recording a synth or a piano that you, you, you're uh, <laughs> recording like a, a proper audio from, um, or if you're recording a room, if you're recording a choir or something that you would like to have a, a left version of and a right version of. Other than that, you would choose mono, actually. So uh, I'm going to choose mono, and I'm going to say record. Uh, like my my in interface is a little bit strange, so it it shows up like this: no string, twelve, 
exclamation mark record number one <laughs> so just letting you know that uh, it might look different uh, with your interface and uh, there might not be as many inputs in your interface and there might be some wrong settings so that nothing is going to show up and we're going to have a look at that once I've added this track what to do if this if it doesn't look anything like this at all I'm going to choose record number one which is in fact the mic that I'm speaking uh, into right now we can also choose a stereo output or uh, or an output for this track that we're uh, we're adding so think of it like um, physical cables like I'm, I'm I'm getting this audio from from this place into this box and where am I sending where am I connecting the cable that goes uh, out again <clears throat> that could be um, uh, a good way of thinking about it so I'm just gonna say vocals or the short version of that which often is a vox all right so we're here uh, I've added a track and suddenly this inspector on the left now has populated and there's a lot of more info Let, let's just have a look at all of these different things that we can have a look at and there's clearly a lot of things we need to talk about in this. Um, and we're going to talk about some of it, <laughs> but not all of it. So this is a an audio track. How do I know that it's an audio track in Cubase? Uh, well, I can, I, I can look at this icon right here. Right here is the icon. Uh, it kind of looks like a waveform if you've seen like the 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 um, the way a um, an audio file looks once it's recorded. If I do the same, but I try to add an instrument again and again, I right clicked in this panel right here, and uh, I I chose add an instrument track instead of an audio track. So if I do that, I, I'll get a list of stuff, and again, this will look different uh, in your setup because I have a, a lot of instrument that, instruments that um, are third party. So they're, they're not coming with uh, the purchase of Cubase. All right, but let's find something that is part of Cubase. Uh, if I can, let's for example, the Retrolog said so the retrolog um, uh, and again there's there's fewer options here um, there's an instrument option and uh, you can choose where the cables go uh, once again so <clears throat> the output right and I can also choose to make uh, several of these which I, I was a able to do with the auto track as well just to be uh, to be clear all right so I added that and it's going to have a little think and it's going to show up with a new window that is actually that instrument. Yeah, so we'll we'll uh, we'll get to this. We'll get to this. So, but I promised to talk to talk about what happens if there's no sound, or if if I I can't get the audio interface to work properly. Well, there's a couple of things I would try, uh, and obviously. You will have to get used to a little bit of tinkering in the world of music production uh, and this is something i tell my students all the time because uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting emails and phone calls about uh, the computers at school not working or their own computers not working and and i try to tell them um, that this is going to happen this happens to me <laughs> some days some days i'll lose like half a day trying to figure something out um so so just be prepared that uh everything is not always going to work and so <clears throat> get on the nerdy hat uh because we'll we'll uh have have use for it <laughs> okay first thing that I'm gonna uh, teach you uh, is um, the the function keys on the keyboard. And uh, if you're working on a laptop, uh, you might have to 
push another button to 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 make uh, to make it possible to do uh, to click the function keys. But I'm talking about the F1, F2, F3, F4. Um, the first one is actually F1, and what that will do is to open up uh, the manual, which is really good. It's really good. So you, here again, you can you can choose the version you're on like the, the uh, version of Cubase. So for me, I'll, I'll choose Cubase Pro. And again, I'll choose Cubase Pro 11. And once I do that, let me see, uh, I can get, I can look at a web help version. This is very, very, very nice. And here I can search for software instrument, for example. And it will tell me that it found 264 documents uh, detailing software instruments. So how about we look for VST instruments? And by looking at that, I can uh, read about it and uh, read about adding them and, and different topics. And it's it's a uh, it's a it's a really powerful way, way to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the functions uh, that are a little bit more obscure, like uh, step input, for example, uh, is one feature. Yeah, so this is a better example. Like, what does it do? How do you use it? And some notes, even uh, great stuff. So. If if you're if you're able to sift through some of this information, you'll learn lots and lots and lots. <clears throat> okay. But uh, yes, so that was F one. F two will show and hide this window, which kind of looks the same as this one window on the bottom, uh, and it kind of is. Uh, like in earlier versions of Cubase. Uh, this transport window wouldn't always be there in the bottom of the screen. So this was how you um, showed it and show and hide the, that window. F3 is going to show and hide the mixer window. Uh, and if all of this stuff is really, really new, then uh, this isn't going to make much sense either. <laughs> but uh, uh, if, if you already know a little bit, then you can see that, uh, for example, this is the, uh, the, the inputs that we can see. Uh, and this is the a vocal track that we all already created. And this is the retro log synth that we already created. And also I can click these buttons and they will expand or uh, collapse to show more settings. There's all sorts of different ways to show or hide more stuff uh, over here by the racks. If I click the F3 uh, another time, it's that window is going to disappear again. So it's 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 a good key command to kind of know if you'd like to uh, work that way. Uh, there's also a, a way to bring the mixer up by by showing or hiding the lower zone, which is. Uh, probably better for laptop users because then it's going to uh, be part of the same window and if you're ever used an app like this before uh, the, this will hide the left panel and the right panel as well or the zone which Cubase calls it all right so and then we're, we're getting to f4 and f4 is the audio connections. And this is where I would start if I was having any problems. <clears throat> so if we click inputs, the input tab here, um, we can kind of recognize if I go back to the mixer window, we have a stereo in here and a mono in. And we can see that this is reflected here. And so if I uh, right click on stereo in and remove that it's also going to remove it from the mixer window so this is where i can kind of set up um, the different inputs i'd like to use and the configurations of those so in cubase uh, it's really easy to rename 
certain configurations if you if you're on a um, a setup that doesn't change a lot. So if you know that my L guitar is always going to be plugged into uh, input number three, then I can add a bus. I can say that is only one signal, and I can say uh, I'd like to call it L guitar. And I can add that bus and say that that's going to be uh, like input number six. And now that would show up as the L guitar. Now this isn't a track, right? This is a, a uh, bus. So this doesn't do anything for the current project. However, if I added another audio track by right clicking in, in this panel, I would be able to now in the audio inputs say L guitar, right? I could choose the L guitar and then that would be routed to the correct spot. So that that is where you can do that. Um, good, 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 good. So in, in the outputs, it, it's kind of the same, the same deal. I, I, I'm, I'm able to add certain um, settings that will be better for my setup. <clears throat> and if you have a look at my setup, I have uh, the stereo out is now routed to stereo out, or, or the output one and output two. Um, we're probably going to keep it at that for now, but I suspect the settings are actually wrong because I'm using the last tab here, which I'm hoping we can uh, get to talking uh, about. Um, <laughs> maybe not in this first segment. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so group and effects, they, you can you can add these on like a, a pro, uh, like a pro global uh, scope. So these will would be there for every project, uh, and you can use your imagination and after a while see that ah, oh, I would like to always have a group of uh, of, of uh, vocals <laughs> in all my project where I always like uh, this kind of reverb in all my projects. And then you can do that. External effects, we're not gonna talk about. I have a, I have a YouTube video about it, uh, so you can try to find that if you'd like to. Uh, you use it basically for adding, uh, if you have external synths like this one, then you can set it up in a way that uh, so that it's always connected and kind of shows up in Cubase as if it were a software instrument. So whenever I go to add an instrument, I, I would be able to say, uh, uh, I'd like to add the K2 or the Crave synth, which both are uh, outboard synths, physical synths. Okay, uh, uh, no, I, I spoke too soon. So this, this was not true. Uh, I was talking about external instruments, and here they already are. Uh, however, external effects is almost the same thing, but instead of in, it being instruments, it, it's going to be uh, like physical reverbs or physical delays or guitar pedals that are always going to be connected. Uh, so you, you can do all of that, which is cool. Control room is something I love, uh, but we haven't set it up. Um, we should probably do that. So if I go, uh, this is going to be a little bit specific for me. So so the audio for you guys is going to be uh, on output three and four, and the output for me is going to be number one and two. And that way I can uh, have a, a couple of different settings, which is nice. And if I go back to outputs now, uh, I actually need to disconnect these because if not I would get double uh, uh, double the volume which I don't want and now this is uh, the control room on the right side so there's a lot of I'm probably moving way too quickly for some of you guys and uh, way too slow for uh, for others and I'm kind of used to that so if I am uh, rewind uh, and I'm gonna try to mark everything uh, as best as I can and, and make kind of a system. So I'm, I'm following a plan loosely and um, I'd like to 
just uh, right now I'm talking about the user interface <laughs> in case that wasn't clear. So uh, um, we've talked about what the inspector can look like uh, and there's a, a different tab called visibility where I can, I can show and hide different tracks. There's also like a track and editor or visibility and zones. It's lots of different stuff that I'm not gonna explain. And on the right hand side on the panel, there's a uh, way to show the different uh, the different synths or, or software instruments that, that are in the project. I can find media that's on my hard drive or is part of Cubase. Or I could just look at a at an output meter, uh, which would also be uh, helpful. All right. So uh, once we we've uh, we've added a, a an audio track and a software synth. How do I play this? If you don't have a MIDI keyboard, um, then there's still a way to do this by hitting Alt or Option K. You can use uh, the QWERTY and some of the numbers. So you, you see here what you need to click in order to have sound. That was super loud. I'm so sorry. Uh, so let's see if we can get that fixed. Because you guys are actually hearing double. You you guys are hearing both both of these. So let me see if that gets better in any way. It's still very, very loud. And so how do I uh, turn down the volume of a track? Well, it's not gonna be in the visibility tab. Uh, that, that much is for certain. So if we click back uh, into the uh, inspector, uh, it's a little hidden, it's not that intuitive in Cubase, um, but right here is the volume fader wh where it says 0.00. .00. Uh, and I can click and go to the left to turn the volume down. That is one way to do it. Um, the way that I do it is I, I click this E letter and uh, <laughs> you, you basically are gonna open the channel settings uh, this way. And this is a very powerful window where again, you see a lot of uh, the different information about this track is helpful. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the earthquake in my house. Um, one thing that I, I'd like to, in uh, like, like a tip for you guys, would be to right click somewhere in in this line right here and and check the always on top. That way I can click around and this window won't disappear. Um, we're probably going to talk a little bit about key commands as well. And Cubase uh, comes with its set of key commands, but there's also a lot of space to create your own. And if we have a little look at uh, the key command window, which you can, by the way, get to by clicking edit and key commands. And I've set this key command for myself, F12 so that I can open it very easily. Um, and right here, you can see some of the many, 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 many possibilities for adding your own key commands for stuff that you'd like to, uh, stuff that you do often, basically. And so if we search here, edit channel, and edit channel settings, uh, my key command for that is the tilde key. And since I'm using a Norwegian keyboard, it shows up as something different, but it's, it's the, the button that's to the left of number one on my keyboard. <laughs> All right. So it's very, very easy to, to access it. Uh, and, and so I, ah, oh, uh, and as long as this on screen keyboard is on, uh, some of these keys won't work still really loud. Um, so let's go back and open it up and turn down the volume. So now, Alt-K again to bring this up. 
And now I have sound, which is good. I'm just going to check if my settings are correct. So if I turn down the control room, it's a lot more quiet in, in my ears, but it won't be in your ears, which is the way I want it. <laughs> very, very good. Um, and again, let's just check uh, some inserts on the stream audio. It's supposed to be a compressor. Let me see. Uh, there we go. There we go. And once more. Okay. Seems to be working. <clears throat> yes. So that is one part of it. But I remember there being a window here uh, of the synth that we were supposed to use. And this, this sound isn't I, isn't very amazing. Uh, so how how do I show that window again if it's not here? And the answer is this little arrow with like, it looks like three three columns. I never click this button because I've uh, assigned it a key command, and my key command for that is uh, like one of the keys that's right next to the return key on the keyboard. Uh, so I, I, I just use them so much that uh, I don't think about those anymore. And uh, there might be better solutions, but you can choose your own. That's the great, uh, great thing about these programs. So uh, if I open this up, it says in it retrolog, which is pretty common with synths. So it's not really a sound, but I can, I can like click different arrows here and right and get different sounds how nice secrets are you on twitter i'll share and tag the stream with your name if you if you do uh yes uh i am on twitter with the um sifter studios tag and thanks by the way so, <coughs> so here we go. Uh, this is now uh, playing one sound, and and I'm I'm playing this from the Retrolog instrument, and there's lots of different instruments that that are uh, will be there if you install Cubase. At least there might be some differences between the different versions of Cubase, but uh, I'm on Cubase Pro. And in Cubase Pro, there's lots of stuff that are uh, in there, there as a stock instrument. I need to show you one more thing though, uh, troubleshooting. So if we go to uh, this studio menu right here and go to studio setup, I've added this key command Alt D. I'm not sure if it's uh, like the, the standard key command or not, um, but I always use the Alt D to, to get this window to show up. So if you don't have any sound at all, this is also one place uh, to look. And if you click, click the topmost um, option here, audio system, here is where I, I would choose my uh, interface. So look for the name of your interface here. If it's, if it's one of these that I showed earlier, um, then it would show up as something focus right, uh, some, something of that nature, focus right SEO if you're on Windows. Um, also, one other thing to keep in mind if you're on Windows is that you're not going to be able to uh, use the same interface for uh, running Cubase as uh, for the rest of your system as long as you're running Cubase, right? So if you're, uh, I'm kind of hacking this system because I have a, 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 a bigger interface. I'm using some outputs of the interface, blah, blah, blah. It's just not important, right? But that was my solution to this issue. Uh, and I know others uh, solve it in different ways. Um, if you're on a Mac, then uh, all those issues kind of go away. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's very nice. So there's no problem using uh, the same interface, um, at least for Cubase. Uh, if you're using Pro Tools, you might run into some issues then. All right. Um, yes, I've talked a little bit about some key commands, but right now I wanted to talk about 
audio interfaces and MIDI interfaces. So <clears throat> we're going to talk more about what these are in a little while. But for now, make sure that this is on the right setting. Uh, if you'd like to, you can release the driver when the application is in the background. And that's going to probably solve the issue of not being able to use the same thing, the same interface for multiple uh, programs. I leave this off because I don't want the, the music to stop if I, if I uh, search the internet or something. And uh, we're not going to talk about too many of these things um, right now. Right now. You can copy these settings if you'd like. The next option is is more information about the interface that you chose. Um, and, and in my case, it's a Lynx Aurora 16. So here I can, for example, choose a buffer size. Now, what is a buffer size, you may ask, and I'll explain it to you. So a buffer size in audio um, is um, I explain it this way. So how long are we giving the computer uh, for, it, for it to think before it has to spit the audio back out again? And so a higher buffer size is going to give the computer more time to think. And that's going to enable it to, to have more settings, to have more uh, instruments, and, and um, uh, it's, it's going to be easier for it to, to uh, deliver on what we uh, ask of it. However, it's also going to add a little bit of delay, and we call that latency in audio. Um, so if you're going to record stuff, you would not be able to hear the sound the instant you uh, sang it or played, played the drum or whatever you're uh, recording. So for recording, uh, we'd like the setting to be lower, and for, the, for mixing, and and finishing stuff, uh, you could you could uh, choose a higher number. Just be aware that a lower number is going to mean that the computer is going to work harder, and have to deliver faster. And so, if I chose buffer size thirty two for this project, it would probably be fine. Uh, and and this that option might not be available to you depending on the uh, grade of uh, recording interface or audio interface. Mm, but I usually usually going to be fine with either 64 or 128 for recording. Uh, and there's other ways to get around this uh, and, and to be safer and, and doing something called uh, direct monitoring. If you'd like to search the web for that and learn a little bit more about it, I'm not going to cover it uh, in this video. So there's ways to get around the issues. Uh, for now, I'm just gonna keep it on 256. That's that's more than adequate for what we're doing here today. I can also choose to show or not show the different inputs and outputs for that specific interface, and that's useful sometimes. Like if I'm, I'm I have a gigantic audio interface, but I'm only using uh, six inputs then there's no point in showing and cluttering the the uh, user interface uh, if I don't need to. So there is a possibility to do that. And I can also choose to, to make uh, the different inputs and outputs active or inactive. And in this case, I've actually, I actually have some options here as well. And say, I can say that I don't want to see any more than eight channels. Um, and that's helping me with the with the whole hacking the system uh, that I talked about earlier. Okay, and then I have lots of different things here that we're not going to talk about at all. All right, but we are going to talk about this MIDI port setup because I have a MIDI keyboard connected right now. It's a very small keyboard, uh, and I, I I usually have a like a full size 88 key uh, keyboard that's connected. But right now, I have a very small uh, keyboard connected, and it's called iRig Keys. And uh, right right now, it's it's set to inactive. So again, it's the same as if we go to the ASIO links um, with the inputs and outputs. It's the same colors, so MIDI in and MIDI out. Think of MIDI like. Um, computer uh, computer signals about the, the different keys that you're uh, clicking. Right, and so I'm just gonna click and check 
this in all MIDI and that notice that that uh, changes the state from inactive to active, right? And click OK. And now if I try to play, I now can I can do that, which is nice. OK. And again, if I have the key command for opening up that uh, the the uh, what's what's the edit instrument to be exact, then I can choose another preset. Right. And there we are. Okay, let's talk about recording stuff. And let's talk about recording audio first of all. So already we've added this audio track. We've set the input to the mono in one, which looks a little bit cryptic in my case. There is something happened with the driver install installation, and uh, probably in your case, it's gonna look like a, like a mono in one or the input one or something something of that nature. And if it again, if it's not there, uh, click F four, have a look at the inputs and and try to route that accordingly. Okay. Good. Um, so I have this selected. I can record, which means that I'm um, writing the uh, the the data that the sound interface gets from that specific cable that is plugged in, right? If I want to listen to it at the same time, which very often you you would want to, uh, I can click this uh, like a speaker, and it says monitor. And the key command for that, that is, is shift, shift D. D. And now, now we're probably, probably hearing, hearing stuff, stuff double. double. So I'm, I'm going to turn that off again. Um, but that is where you do that. And I can also record without hearing back. So if I if I click record, um, and that is the asterisk uh, or the, uh, uh, yeah, asterisk. No, not the, yeah. Is it the asterisk? The star on the keypad. Um, if I click that, then I'm actually now recording this track and it turns red and you can have a look at it the way it is right now. And if I click space, then uh, I've, I've stopped the recording. And I can see that something appeared here. I can click it or I can click in the the white space where, where there's nothing and it deselects it. Right, and when I click it, all of this stuff populates, and there's a lot of uh, information here that we, we can use, which is helpful. But uh, I'd like to see it a little bigger, uh, and and the way I do that is to use the uh, the keys G and H, where H will zoom you in and G will zoom you out. So those are really great to to get uh, to, to, to remember <laughs> right it looks like this great stuff okay uh, and if I'd like if I if if, uh, uh, if I wanted to I could uh, recolor this track and I do that over here select color for selected tracks or events so depending on if I've selected the one one particular event, which Cubase calls these regions. Uh, so if I record something over here as well and, and stop, then these are two separate events. And other programs call them uh, audio regions or MIDI regions. In Cubase, they're called events. Okay, uh, that is me recording some audio. And if, if we listen back to it, if I click that, then I'm actually now recording this track and it turns red and you can have a look at it the way it is right now. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, very good, very good. Uh, what did I just do? I, I just did a lot of different things. Uh, let me see, uh, what am I gonna explain first? So the first thing I did was to click the option or the alt key. And what that does is a little depending on what you're hovering over. So if I'm in a, a place where there's no region, I, the symbol turns into a, a pencil, which means I can 
draw in regions which obviously are empty, right? But uh, uh, that can be helpful sometimes. If I'm hovering over a specific event or region, then it turns into this scissor thingy, and which means that I can snip off parts of it. I can snip off that beginning, and if I click on it and click on backspace, then uh, I delete that little thing. It's not deleted forever, so if I go down to the lower right part, again, this symbol, the tooltip is going to change to these double arrows, which means I can drag this out again. So it's all there. I'm just editing it. So that is uh, helpful, helpful. Okay. And right there, obviously I use the control Z uh, or command Z to undo. Uh, and I believe uh, sh control shift Z will, will redo if you, if you, uh, undoing a uh, undo <laughs> all right so um, that is recording audio super a super simple version of recording audio obviously we're gonna go into more depth uh, during this uh, monster stream but uh, for now that is that is uh, helpful hopefully okay I'm gonna record some MIDI and again, if you don't have a MIDI keyboard handy, you can use the Alt K or Option K to get this on-screen keyboard up. There's also different ways to to uh, to add notes. For example, I can click that Alt button again or Option button and draw in an empty MIDI region. And if I click Enter here, it will open up a new window where I can do lots of different stuff. Uh, we're not going to do that yet. Not going to do that yet. So first, first things first. If I click play right now, I'm not hearing a metronome. What is a metronome? That is the the tempo of the song. So it's gonna give you like a a, a sound that will enable you to play in the same tempo, which is helpful um, and enables us to to kind of fix stuff afterwards rhythmically and do all sorts of cool stuff. So. Uh, might be a good idea in these modern times to use a metronome uh, or uh, let the program know what tempo you're currently playing in. You can change that, by the way, uh, down here. So right here where it says 120, that is uh, where you assign the tempo of the song. <clears throat> So 120 right now, uh, but I don't know how that sounds, and that is because we haven't activated the metronome click, which you can do by clicking this button or clicking C on your keyboard. So you can see this turning off and on, and if I play now, usually you would be able to hear that. However, he said, and this sometimes happens with uh, uh, with the control room settings. So let me see if I can remember this. So this is now on. And click sounds. Let's just do default sounds. Steinberg click sounds. And uh, vintage spike is the ones I like. There we go. So then we're back. So <clears throat> you can copy that if you suddenly don't have sound. <coughs> okay, so if I, again, to start and stop playback, I'm just using space. Uh, I could also use the enter key on the numpad, uh, but I'm not doing that because I've changed all of the other things in the numpad to do um, some other stuff. <laughs> but Space bar works great for me. So you can hear it, it playing uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It's, it's, it's repeating and every four beats, it's getting a different uh, type of sound, okay? Which is helpful because then we know where the downbeat of, of the song will be. Okay. 
Well, I'm, I'm just gonna find something that's not a bass sound, so g give me... Uh, what do we want to do? Okay. And I'm just gonna do this. Some happy clappy thing. Let's try to record it. So uh, now I'm, I'm gonna uh, click the uh, asterisk again, the star icon on the numpad and go into recording this and try my best uh, to play, not play any mistakes. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So that was, uh, I don't know, 16 bars of uh, something. And once I stopped playback, we can now see that uh, we have a, a, a region or an event uh, with some data in it. It has some blobs in, in there and we can kind of see that it moves up and down and uh, looks kind of like what I played on the keyboard. And that is exactly right. That is exactly what we did. We've recorded the um, the data for the different notes, how hard I played each, each note, how long I held the key down. Uh, and it, in this MIDI world, you could do a lot of uh, more advanced stuff if you'd like, but this is good enough for now. So if I, I can open this up in another window, either by double clicking or by uh, selecting it and clicking enter. And if I do that, it's gonna open down here in the lower zone. If I'd like to have this open in a separate window, I can click this button. I have, as, as with a lot of different things, added uh, a key command that is gonna do a couple of different things for me. So um, that is why it's, why it's set up like this. Um, and in this window, we, you, you can again see all of these different notes. I can use G and H to zoom in and zoom out. I can always use the middle mouse button to click and drag, which is very helpful sometimes. And lots of other different things. We can now have a listen to this. Um, if I do option shift and click, I can click and place the playhead uh, where I would like it to start playback. Okay, um, cool, but it's not perfect in, in rhythm, which is very common. Uh, and for this type of sound, which is very percussive, I would, I'd like it to be perfect. Um, so how do I do that? Well, uh, it has to do with this part right here. You can see this giant Q, which means apply quantize. And th these settings right now would be perfect uh, for, for, uh, for what I want to do. I want to move these into the correct spot. So if I if I have a look at this chord right here, I know that it should be right on this line number three, bar number three, but it's not. So I can either control A, just like in, in Microsoft Word, to select everything, or if I have nothing selected, it's actually gonna do the same thing. So <clears throat> I'm just gonna leave it like this and, and click the Q button on uh, my keyboard and just have a look. Let's 
let's zoom right in and just have a look at what happens. So right now it moved a little bit, uh, but it didn't move all the way towards uh, the, the correct place. And that has to do with my settings because right now I have this mode on, which is called soft quantize, which does exactly what it sounds like. It, 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 it tries to find the correct place, but it doesn't move it 100%. Uh, you can choose how much you're gonna move it by the quantize strength, which is right here. It might be uh, hidden like this, but if you open it up, quantize strength, it's 60% uh, right now. So I can click this once and, and kind of have a listen to it. So what I'm doing here, I'm already uh, uh, starting to work and not speak, which is um, very common of me, I'm sorry. So first of all, I can, I can, as you saw, I can click and select something and move it up and up or down. And I can also kind of spot obvious mistakes like this little bugger right here. Uh, and maybe this guy, let's have a listen. There we go. So, and if you if you're doing a lot of that stuff and you don't want to hear it, uh, the every time you you do a change, you can click this speaker right here and and turn on or off the acoustic feedback, which is also I believe no, it's not. <laughs> I spoke too soon. Uh, if I click return again, this window disappears, which is very very handy. So. Uh, I've, I've set it up to be uh, a one key command to open it up and, and enter uh, or return to close it. And if I just click return here, then it's going to open in the lower, uh, lower zone and it's going to disappear in the same way again. Okay, good. Uh, so we've, we've recorded some audio, we've recorded some MIDI. That's uh, already a lot, uh, and uh, if you're following along, this is really great progress, I believe, <laughs> uh, if, especially if everything is new to you. So again, I did the exact same thing, option click and backspace to get rid of these. So let's say that these guys uh, were supposed to be a song or something. Uh, so this, this would be a uh, vocal part, and this would be the, the uh, keys part. Uh, and if, if you'd like to move stuff, you can do it like this. Some, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, balance uh, telling you, not telling you everything and um, also not move too fast. So um, we'll see how it goes. Um, but, but say that I want to export this right here. Um, Obviously now in this view, you could see that I have some space in the beginning and I have a lot of space at the end. So I need to tell Cubase what to export because Cubase in and of itself doesn't know that. And I can do that a couple of different ways. I'm gonna show you the, the, the uh, in, in an easy way. So first of all, uh, control A or command A will select everything in this view, uh, which is helpful. If I now click the P, the letter P, uh, something happened. So these locators are now at the great, uh, exact length uh, as uh, the, the, the beginning um, of the events that I've selected that has D 
data in it and the end, which is very helpful because now I can export based on this range. I can make this range bigger or smaller if I want to, or I could click P again to uh, make it go around everything that I've selected. If I've only selected the the audio region, it's it's going to be shorter, obviously. But if I shift select both of them and, and click P, then it's going to uh, uh, be <laughs> big enough to export both of them without losing any data, he said, but there's there might be some issues with that. So just to save you a, a little trouble, uh, we're already gonna just extend the end a little bit because if you can hear the sound, it has uh, some effects on it that is making the, so uh, the, the sound last longer than I uh, click the keys. So to make sure that every uh, everything is I'm not cutting off the end of the song, basically. Then I'm I'm just extending the latter part of the selection, and it's called the locator locators. You can also select the locator uh, range down here, right locator position or left locator position, and there's some key commands for those. Uh, I just use the the P. If if you do the if you do Alt P. That clip is actually going to do a couple of things. It's going to uh, make this purple and it's going to start playback. So what the purple means is that it's going to loop once it gets to the end. So let's just see that. If I double click here, it's going to start playback from wherever I have my mouse. If I click that, all right. I don't need that, so I'm, I'm just going to click it. Uh, I can also do the backslash on the numpad to turn that uh, feature on or off, just so you guys know that. And now I can export this. So that's going to be the next task. And to do that, I'll, I'll go to File, Export, Audio Mixdown. And my key command for this is F11. So again, you can... Uh, get the window to show uh, by, by clicking the key command that you assign to, to that function and yourself. Okay, so um, here you get a lot of different settings um, and we'll talk about some of them. The first, the, the main important part here is what's the range that I'm exporting, like Am I exporting the whole project or just part of the song? Uh, am I, uh, yep, and all that kind of stuff. So right now it's it's set to locators, which is what we added here. We added the locators. There's also a, a possibility to um, export by cycle markers. We don't know about cycle markers yet, so don't 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 worry. Uh, choose locators, and we're choosing to export. Uh, the stereo out, which is the output, which is what we're hearing. Uh, I could choose to only export the the MIDI instrument, and then I would only hear the MIDI instrument, or I could choose to export only the vocal track, which would mean that I only heard the vocal track. But I want to hear the mix of both of them, so I'm going to choose stereo out. You can choose to export multiple uh, uh, tracks, and if you do, it's going to look a little different. For now, uh, like I said, we want to hear both of them in one file. So that's what we're going to do. Here, uh, I can name it. I can choose a path for it. If I don't uh, change this, it's is its um, default behavior is going to be to save it in the project folder in a folder called Mixdown, which is perfect. Uh, because then it's going to be in the same spot and it's easy to find the files if you lose them, uh, which is very nice, right? So that was uh, a new addition to Cubase 11, I think. Uh, and I like that. I like that. So you also get a preview of what the naming scheme is going to look like. And, and if uh, by naming scheme, I mean I can, I can click this cog. 
right here and do all sorts of different things. It's gonna be a little bit more advanced. Uh, right now, I can just say my first song, V1, which is gonna be version one. Okay, conflicts means if I'm trying to export a file that's already there with the same name, uh, are you gonna ask me or are you gonna just create a different name or are you going to overwrite the file and lose the old one and keep the new one? Okay. Uh, Again, here you can save different presets for the file format uh, thingy. Uh, so first of all, you could choose a file type, WAV file on it, and a AIFF file is basically the same thing. Uh, AIFF is Apple's version, and WAV is Microsoft's version. And uh, I use WAV, um, and both of them will work in in uh, it's not like the Apple version is only going to work on Apple machines and, and vice versa. Um, you can use both of them uh, and, and they're basic, basically the same. No real preference. I feel like wave, the WAV file is becoming more of a standard than the AIFF file though. MPEG 1 layer 3 is a really fancy way of saying MP3. And FLAC is a like a lossless, it, it, it's very much close to a WAV file, but um, OG Vorbis is uh, the game industry's version of an MP3 file. So in, in uh, if you're working with video games, the .ogg um, file type is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be really helpful that you can export to that from Cubase. I'm just gonna choose WAV file. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm not gonna explain all of these different things. Um, I am, however, gonna um, advise you to uh, choose interleaved right here because then you're gonna end up with one file. If you choose split channels, then you're gonna end up with two files, one for the left speaker and one for the right speaker. And, and how, <laughs> um, how is that useful in 2021? Um, I've, I've never used it that way. It was more important in the earlier days, I believe. Um, in, in Pro Tools, you can also choose to have files interleaved or not. And I, I haven't really come up with a, with a, group, a, a time where I would need the left and the right speaker to be separated into different files. But, uh, so leave it at interleaved. Uh, make it uh, uh, choose a name, and again, uh, you can say after the export, do stuff. But I don't, I, I don't use that option. Okay, I am going to uh, choose real time export, which means that the computer is going to work as fast as it can. To export things but it, it's not going to play the sound back through the speakers uh, if you don't have this on and you have a project that is 20 minutes long then the export is going to take 20 minutes uh, but if it's checked off for uh, i'm sorry i'm uh, uh, of course i, I <laughs> in pro tools when it's checked it means the opposite so uh, I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> so if it's not checked it's not going to be in real time <sighs> okay <clears throat> So now it's gonna work as fast as it can, uh, but if I check it, it's gonna play it in real time. Okay, so, and now I just click export audio and have a look. Boom, that is now done. And if I open up a uh, Explorer and try to find, uh, doop, uh, doop, doop. Music production in Cubase, my first song, mixed down. And here is the song. And if I double click it to have a listen, you guys want to click that. Here it is. And I'm actually now recording yes, this will. track. And it turns red, and you can have a look at it the way it is right now. Okay. Great stuff and a big success. <laughs> okay, so we've recorded audio we've recorded midi we've exported it we have even quantized the audio which means like 
nudge the, the MIDI notes um, to be more rhythmically correct, which is very nice. Um, and that actually marks uh, the, the completion of module one of the course usually. Uh, so I'm going to have a look at the next module, which is going to be all about production. So we're going to be moving at a pretty brisk pace here. Um, and if you guys have any questions, um, if you're watching live, um, you can ask them, no worries. And I'll try to weave them into the, uh, into the teaching. All right, one zip. Mm. What was the uh, uh, Explorer thing? It's called Directory Opus, and I love it. Which uh, enables me to do stuff like this. This is why I bought it, because if you hover over a WAV file, you'll see a preview of, um, <coughs> of the waveform. So I really, really, really like that. Obviously, you should always listen to uh, everything that you've exported to make sure that uh, there's not something strange going on. But I, uh, I like to just have a quick peek. And if I see that there is no, no audio at all on the track, then I can, I can know that something's wrong. Um, so this is very, very, very nice and has a lot of different things you can do. Like, um, just very quickly, uh, enable you to rename a lot of uh, tracks at the same time, and it's very, very helpful. All right, <clears throat> so the next point um, is actually going to be to create a, a new project. So we're going to do that. I'm going to, uh, I, I clicked Control W or Command W to close the project and Control or Command N to get this window up and create a new project. So again, we're going to create a new empty project, prompt for project location, click Create. And instead of saving this in the same folder as we where we just were, um, which was the folder structure of my first song, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to create a new folder and say my second song, which is going to be a lot better, I assure you. <laughs> Let me see. Is there any way I'm, I'm, I want to be able to kind of draw a little bit for you guys. There we go. So it was indeed Photoshop it was acting up. <laughs> Maybe not right now, but soon we're going to do a little bit of drawing. So uh, just going to make that ready over here. Yes, very good. Okay, so what I like to do for, for the course is to talk a little bit about, where are you? Hello? Maybe I'll need to minimize Cubase to see this. Oh, you're here. Okay. <laughs> so that's what you did. Okay. That is my uh, StarCraft build order thingy. <laughs> but that was not the point. Uh, so I'm using, uh, never mind the app. It's not important. Uh, this is for, for coding and programming and stuff. Um, but I might just want to make this a lot bigger. Okay, so um, we're going to try to plan what we're going to do, which is something I rarely do, to be honest. I rarely do this, but I think it's, it's, I think I should do it more often, to be honest, because there's a lot of uh, um, shortcuts we can take if we kind of know where we're going. So my second song uh, should be about, should be like, okay. And we can create a list. Um, 
So, uh, what do we guys, uh, what do we want to make? I would like, I would like uh, some old synths in the uh, uh, 80s realm. Uh, I'm going to say, I like triplets. Maybe I incorporate that. Um, I can say sparse drums and maybe some shakers for um, keeping the pulse. This is just my thoughts in the moment right now. And rith this is, I'm probably writing rhythmic wrong. I'm sorry, not uh, English uh, as a native language. Rhythmic bass, uh, sort of a percussive thing. Okay. Mm. Minor. Okay, <laughs> so we have a little list now, <clears throat> um, and that's nice. What if I move this list? Oh, I'm going to do something fancy. I'm going to do something fancy now, uh, and my window is right here. <laughs> okay, there we go. No, there we go. Now, if I do this, oh. So what happened? Uh, why is my screen not working the way it should? Yes, it is now. Great. So we have a little list. Maybe it's readable. Uh, that, that would be awesome if it was. So back to it. Uh, we have this project. Where are you? There we go. And again, the first thing that I'm going to do is save the project so that it, um, it, uh, Cubase knows where to put the audio files and stuff. So I'm going to say my second song V1, version 1. And now I'm going to add some some things. I'm going to add some things. <clears throat> Let's add some stuff. What if we did some audio? Um... Uh, and I'm going to say that uh, add a couple of these. So I'm going to add three and uh, give them the name audio. And if I click on add track, it's auto numbering them, uh, which is very nice, right? And then I'm going to add some instruments. Uh, I'll add three Retrolog instruments. And now I've added three synths to my setup, which can have different settings, right? And all of that stuff. Okay, there we go. Um, we want a little bit more. And I'm going to try to uh, source the, uh, uh, the instruments that is part of Cubase. Uh, yes, sort by vendor, if we do that, and say Steinberg. And we can have a look at maybe the Groove Agent. Now, I don't use Groove Agent that much, uh, so I'm, I might have to look a little bit uh, around to make sure that it works. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it if if I'm uh, not providing you value fast enough then I'm just gonna go to what I usually use. And we're, we're talking mostly about the concepts of pr music production. So sometimes I'm gonna use stuff that uh, is third party stuff, I think. I'm interested in creating tools. Example, do MIDI velocities fall within average ranges? Example, if velocity one through 30 means slow, make instrument envelope, reverberant, slightly discordant, dragged. Uh, let, me, let me read that again.
Yeah, definitely possible, but I would more uh, properly have a look in the synth itself. But you would like to have it as a lucky MIDI um, MIDI insert, probably. There's this thing called MIDI inserts. And you, I don't think you can make your own. Maybe with a transformer you could do stuff. Like dragging slow strings or blowing horns slowly in physical modeled instruments. Yeah, I get what you what you mean and how you'd like to kind of filter out those kind of things. Um, wouldn't, uh, there shouldn't be, like, I, I'm not gonna go into specific synths, but there's definitely ways of telling the synth how to behave uh, depending on velocity, which is uh, what you're trying to do as far as I can read. So that should be possible. Uh, uh, or if you'd like to, I don't know, um, copy it and move it to a different track, there's also ways to do that with the uh, Project Logical Editor or the Logic Editor, Logical Editor. Um, but we're not going to get into that today. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to continue adding some stuff. So because I know that I would, uh, I'd like some bass, I'd like, uh, let me see, sampler, so we have the Hallion, but that is also third party, even though it's from Steinberg. Um, pad shop. What about the pad shop? Let's add three of the pad shop. And then three of the prologue. Right, so we have we have some stuff. Can we find the output channel and just turn it down a little bit? Is that gonna work out for everyone? I think so. So that is in mono. the groove agent again I'm using the key commands I talked about earlier to uh, uh, open up the different things here so what if we did 80s pop that's exactly what I would like Johnny hates kit that sounds awesome and I'm gonna move down some octave And now I'm just gonna try to find a tempo. All right. Uh, I'm gonna try 90. So I'm just double clicking here and clicking enter. That was too slow. So what about a hundred? Gonna settle on 105, I believe. So it's gonna be a very triplety feel. So uh, let's have a look here, and I'm gonna do this. Zoom in and move the region back. And I've set up some key commands to go to the beginning and the end of that uh, of the uh, locator selection. So uh, I, I might be a little bit special, but I really hate when when you, um, in in most uh, programs like this, you can say that I want you to when I click record, I want you to play two beats or two bars before you start recording, and I really don't like that. I like to be in control by myself, so I'd like to add that bar my, uh, myself. Uh, another question from Secret. 
fair enough. I don't want to disrupt the course. I'll keep researching. I'll then provide it up to share as a viewer so that you know there is demand uh, in defining, creating accessible realism tools. Well, uh, if you'd like, uh, then uh, you can uh, uh, hop into the Discord and we can have a chat about it afterwards or send me a message or an email and uh, I'll, I'll be more than happy to uh, add it to the list of videos. Definitely. It's just going to be a little bit out of the scope of, um, of tonight. Yep. Um, all right. So I'm just, I'm going to start with the drums and I'm just going to see what happens. And one thing that is cool to be aware of is down here in the left page, um, there is, uh, a possibility to turn on or off what happens if you record something over a MIDI event that's already there. So what if I had this and I recorded something again, uh, should I keep what is already, already there or should I write over it? And I like it for this to always be on merge. I'd like to always add to it. And that enables me to do something like this. So, uh, oh, by the way, to zoom uh, in, in the vertical direction, I, I just use the same buttons, but uh, add shift to the mix. So open it up like that, right? Beautiful. I'm happy that you are understandable secret. Great. Uh, okay. so. Let me see what comes of this. And three and four. Okay, so that might not make sense to uh, to you guys yet, but. Uh, uh, Hopefully it will. <laughs> so right here, I can choose the uh, note value that I'm going to quantize, quantize by. And uh, last time we didn't have to do that because it, what, the settings were already correct, but now they aren't. Uh, the, the settings right now are set to uh, one uh, eighth notes. However, I need them to be uh, eighth note triplets. And so I'm going to change it towards that and I don't even have to open up this window. I can just click Q and have a listen. Okay, good. And now <clears throat> I'll also talk about um, these settings. So right now we are set to grid mode and we're, we've set this to um, use quantize. Now, what does that mean? Uh, grid, if I turn it off by, by clicking a J, will mean that I'm, I'm no longer moving in increments with the playhead. I'm moving uh, without any increments, right? If I hit J again, then I can see that it's kind of jumping instead of being like a, a flawless motion. And the use quantize option means that whatever I say here is going to be the value, note value that I'm going to move it by. So if I change this now to be whole bars, then I'm, this is going to be a lot more apparent, right? And what I've done, which you do not have to do, but I've done this is that I've, um, uh, changed all the keys on the keypad to, to work a little bit like a, a, a note, a uh, notation program called Siberius. Uh, works. So I have uh, the four is going to be, if you had a look up here, the four is going to be quarter notes, three is going to be uh, a triplet toggle, five is going to be eighth notes, six is going to be sixteenth notes, 
two is going to be half notes and one is going to be whole notes. So I'm, I'm just going to explain right now why I sometimes will be in the eight note triplets and, and move a little bit back and forth. And now I really wanted to cut the beginning and the end and be sure that that was going to be done on the beat. And so I changed the quantize uh, note value to whole bars, which means that everything I do, whether it's it's cutting stuff up or moving, it's all gonna be done in increments of one bar. For overriding MIDI, is it possible to turn off pitch notes and only recording expression? For example, if you want to overwrite the velocity, then only be pressing velocity records, not notes. I don't think so. Um, well, like expression is different. If you're talking about uh, literally expression, CC11, con uh, continuous controller 11, that you can definitely record uh, separately. But for the velocity, mm, I'm not aware of a way to do that. It's pretty easy to, uh, if we open it up again, this window, uh, right now the velocity is down here. And that is, uh, that's a great question because <laughs> it reminds me that I need to talk about this. So let's try to make it a little bigger, which I can do by doing this. So now I can see that all of these have different values assigned to them. And so if I, slash these in half. So right now there, um, um, you hear a difference in volume in different instruments, this would behave differently. So in some instances, a, a higher velocity would make it sound like uh, you were playing the instrument harder uh, and, but in this case, the, we're using a drum sampler, so it's just going to be volume up and down. Um, but just to be aware that, uh, there might be some differences. So what I'm going to do, and hi, John, by the way, um, I'm going to again, select everything, control A. And now if I hover over this whole part, we're getting a lot of different, uh, squares that you can do different things with. And this is, uh, for, for, the, for those of you that are interested, this is the one feature that made me move to Cubase <laughs> from, uh, I think it was uh, Ableton that I used uh, before uh, Cubase, but this was the, the last uh, thing that I needed to, to jump from one uh, program to the other. It's really, really nice. Um, uh, so secret, uh, uh, fair, I'm not a musician, so I'm having to use steps and scale options. Well, awesome. Uh, let's see if we can explain that to the others as well during the stream. So I try to add realism, uh, to compensate. Yeah. I appreciate all of your patience with my questions. No worries at all. Uh, I, I, I get which, where you're coming from. Um, so one thing that I would, um, I would, um, point you towards is the, where is it? The here. Mm, 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 mm. He said, there is a way to randomize it kind of uh, sounds to me like a, um, like you have like a programming mindset. So I would definitely read up on the logical editor and say like the type is uh, yes, the type is equal to a note. So everything that's a note that is selected, I'd like to uh, set random values between uh, 50 and 80. Let's see if that does anything in this case. It does, but it changed now it changes notes, which is not of what I wanted. Um, 
and parameter two. No, there is a way to do this, uh, but this is stuff you can read up on. So value two is probably gonna be uh, the velocity. So now if we say 50, some of this can be, be a little cryptic, but uh, no, it's, it's doing the same thing. <laughs> but we didn't change the random values, 50 and 80. Okay, yes, there we go. So value two uh, from the selected stuff would be uh, the correct way to do uh, small randomizations of, of um, velocity. Okay, if that was Greek to you uh, and, and you're not from, from Greece, then uh, never mind. <laughs> okay, so what I wanna do is since this is a drum, um, uh, a drum sample, I'd like it to be the uh, the same every time. Um, and the way I make sure that that happens is to just max out the velocity. Uh, and, the, and in this case, it's gonna be the volume. So now uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start off like that and maybe do some small differences. And that is just the drummer in me. Um, but let's have a look here. Let's play. Okay, so an example again. So I'm, I'm doing that ba boom, ba boom kind of thing because that is the way it sounds when you play it, uh, at least when I play it on drums. All right, uh, that was one point. Um, now, again, I'm gonna go back to the beginning and uh, just add some snares. Okay, and four, and do. Mm. Okay, so a couple of mistakes, which is good because now I can open it up and kind of show what I would do to fix it. So first of all, this guy is not gonna be, it's not meant to be there. Um, I, I turned off the acoustic feedback, by the way, so we're not hearing every every note I, I click. Which can be a little obnoxious. So now, a good question uh, would be to ask yourself, if I was gonna quantize this, which note value would I need? Um, and I think I'm just gonna keep it at the eighth note triplet again, uh, because I had a little fiddle uh, at, at some point. But if, if I didn't, I could say uh, quarter notes instead in this case. So um, that is something you kind of need to, a muscle you might have to, um, to, to exercise a little bit. And over time, that's gonna be easier. Okay, so again, we can see that it doesn't move um, all the way into a perfect position. And that's the way I like to do the quantizing usually um, because that um, kind of enables you to, to, to keep some of the performance uh, for, for good or for worse. <laughs> all right, so let's see. Okay, and, and places where the kick and snare hit at the same time, I'm, I'm gonna quantize it harder because I, I don't like, the, like that. I would like those to be very tight. Like that one. Okay, great. Uh, now let's kind of make sense of it all. Let's try to find something.
turned off the click by clicking C, and so now I need to turn it on again when I'm recording. Three, four. Okay. Almost, uh, there's a little thing missing right here, and so I'm just gonna kind of see and copy, and I click and uh, hold Alt or Option to do that. And again, I'm selecting only the things that I would like to quantize now. Again, the uh, uh, eighth note triplets is gonna be what I want. So I'm just gonna have a quick listen. And even if I'm in this window, I can open up this groove agent and probably, let's see, where's the hi-hat? There we go, pedal hi-hat, okay, I don't care. Um, but I would like to turn it down in volume. Okay, I'm just gonna add some quarter notes here with a tambourine. Three and four and. these I'm just going to change this to quarter notes and off you go and again jingle bells I can also move stuff to the right or to the left and, and do all sorts of different things with these sounds. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to take the hi-hat, move it a little to the, to the to my left and uh, move the jingle bells to the right a little bit, to my right. That is some kind of a groove um, that we might be able to use for something. So now I've made, uh, is this 16 bars? I believe it is. Uh, and that's good. If I click Control D or Command D, I can duplicate this. <laughs> oh, wow. We'll see what, what comes of this. Okay, uh, so let's say uh, main drum beat. What did I just do? So I did shift enter, and I believe that's a custom key command. Um, and I'm just gonna double check that. Uh, rename uh, and go to rename first selected track. Yes, this is a, a custom key binding, I believe. Rename first selected track. So I do that, shift enter, and then I can just rename. Um, and if I'm in that mode, I can just hit tab or shift tab to move up or down, which I find very handy. So I try to rename tracks as I go. Um, let's. Let's see if we can find a bass sound, a synth bass. Like I can use my arrows uh, here, I believe. Yes. 
Okay, I like that. I'm just gonna add a little setting. I'm not gonna explain like synthesis um, in this video. Where's the cutoff? There we are. No, that's the low pass. Where are you? I want, yes. Okay. And Something, something. Let's just move along. <laughs> did something there that I'm going to explain soon. Right here, I moved along. Again, we're moving along in, in, in the grid mode. Um, and I can set the note value here, or I could set it by my keys, right, which we talked about. Uh, if I have something selected and click Alt X, Alt plus X, I will split at that point in time. So that is what I did. So I do some of these things without thinking uh, and I, I'll have to explain them afterwards. <laughs> so sorry about that. There you go, I just did it again. And now I opened, opened up this window again. And again, I'm gonna choose eighth note triplets uh, and zoom out a little bit and quantize a little bit, maybe two times. Let's see if we can get some chords. So we'll, we'll rename this bass. Bass. Okay. Um, and let's find. It doesn't look the same. Just do this. No. <clears throat> Shuffle, which is also very nice. I'd like to do the filters. There we go. Great. Um, let's do a synth uh, pad, maybe? Analog. <laughs> we have any brass here yes we do we have some synth brass I do set up workspaces to see pre-roll um, believe pre-roll I I hate pre-roll <laughs> so I've I never use it but I believe these will do what you want Right here. Um, in two seconds, I'm just going to find the sound. Yeah, close enough. So I believe these are what you're looking for. Punch. Nope, that's the punch in. Uh, all, uh, all over the place, you have these three buttons that can expand your view. Uh, 
this would be primary time shift no Hmm. Well, this would be a great example of when it would be nice to uh, open up here and see pre-roll. So this is how you do it. Ah, this is negative number bars. Okay. And I want that in my QBs. I'll explain that. So I'm just going to do the pre-roll pre and post-roll, uh, which would be... First of all, by in the transport panel and transport. Okay. Transport. Okay, here. Pre-roll. Which which would be just for anyone that's wondering, this kind of pre-roll would be uh, to, when you go to record, then you'd say two bars of um, um, before you're actually starting recording, but uh, the metronome would uh, sound. Uh, however, this uh, is very easy. Shift S for project settings. And you'll say display bar offset. And I've set mine to five bars so that I'm able to, this is really great for when you're working with uh, scores, for example. Uh, and I would like a little space before bar number one. And so this is where you could do that. You can choose how many bars you, you'd like. And for some reason, I think it, it, it saves globally. So no worries, John, no worries. All right, so we have, uh, what kind of chords do we have? I'm gonna show you uh, like some of the things that I usually do. So I'm gonna add um, a, a new type of track that we haven't talked about. There's a lot of different types of tracks, but one that is very cool is a chord track. So I'm gonna uh, drag a chord track up to the top. And I'm actually, I'm actually going to click this little divider, divide track list. And if I do that, the whole screen kind of divides. And so if I had a lot of different tracks and scroll down this part uh, at the top of the divider wouldn't disappear, which is very, very nice and something that I think not too many other programs have, but Cubase has it. So I'm going to add that and, um, and try to make sense of what kind of chords we made. I'm just going to create some placeholder thingies. Okay, so I need to Let's try to find something. Hmm. We'll see. So first one, I can actually click it and uh, if I set this into record, he said. Why won't you work today? Oh, I actually need to double click it to make that happen. Yes. So if I double click it and go to the next. Uh, Again, next, we do this very quickly. I'm just gonna turn down the volume of this while we work. And then, I'm gonna do this. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, uh, no, I'm gonna keep it at an A minor. <laughs> So uh, we're going to do the same and just do this. Okay. And I'm just going to get rid of so I can do this as well just copy them over do a F major F major 9 with an A in the bass It is going to work. C and no, an E minor seven and a G. Okay, great stuff. Namaste, namaste, Ash. I hope you're doing well. So. Again, I'm duplicating by clicking uh, Control D or Command D. Great stuff. So these will be some chords. And one quick tip that you can do is to just drag down these chords. And it's going to turn into MIDI notes. Um, Mr. Ram John, thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. And see you around. So, I'm going to move this uh, and the way I move it, in case you were wondering, is why? Why? There we go. Is by uh, doing control and left and right arrow and it's going to move again in our settings over here. Okay, <clears throat> we're moving pretty, pretty quickly. There you go. I want the sustain to be down a little bit on this guy because I want the sound to be uh, closer or, or uh, shorter.
So we call this synth brass. And uh, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna spend an eternity uh, creating this because what's the time? Oh, okay, okay. So we've been um, streaming for two hours, uh, give or take. And I will soon need a toilet break, but uh, <laughs> until then, <laughs> we will continue. So again, just adding these up so that we have uh, a little bit more of a, uh, a little bit longer length and we can do some arranging after a while. After a while. Um, but what about trying to find some kind of melody? That would be, that would be cool. Um, let's see if I have it in me. This is a pet shop, so let's do the prologue. And see if we can find something. Synth lead, and let's just randomize the results. Oof, I'm very sorry. Very, very sure I have no, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> maybe, maybe the uh, prologue is not meant to uh, be used. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm saying no thank you to to that and uh, let's go for patch up instead. <clears throat> that is obviously not the way the, that instrument is supposed to sound. Do I have sound at all now? Is the question? Yes, we do. Okay, so what if we did uh, the filters again and tried a synth lead? So some of these are very nice. I don't like the, the, the sounds that have like fifths in them. Brutal scream, that sounds promising. But I want something uh, that's not supposed to be a bass sound, so let's move up a little bit. Is this sounding even? Apparently recorded that. Okay, so what if that was an amazing idea? Right, I'm not saying that it is or that it isn't. But what if it was an amazing idea and we want to keep it? Okay, so that's first. So I 
actually played it uh, straight. So let's go dives. Yes, I know. I've I've been aware for quite some time. Secret. <laughs> There's there is some resemblance. <laughs> Uh, let me see. Um, so the point of the point of tonight is not uh, that I make my my best work ever, but hopefully uh, there be, there will be some learning in this. Let me see. I'm just I'm just pushing buttons. I don't really know this pad shop. So randomness did some cool stuff. Just gonna open it up, select everything, and uh, do shift down arrow, which is gonna move everything down one octave. Uh, no, they're not stacked. They're not stacked at all. Uh, it's just a way for Cubase to show it uh, in in a bigger, so it's easier to see. So if I zoomed a lot in, they they would stay on the same line. So it's just because I've I've made the track bigger, so it's it's a little bit more readable. The question was why are they uh, stacked in this way? <clears throat> All right, um, boom, boom, boom. And one thing I would like to add is some sort of effects. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about all of these things. But at the point we're at now, I just would like if, if you're at uh, um, if you're very new and you're following along, then uh, I, I would like this part of the journey to just be uh, like a playground. Just uh, what happens if we turn this knob? One thing I would like to add is just go over to the effects and let me just read sideways here and say I would like the feedback to be a lot higher. <laughs> That's the sound. Cool. So at this point, we've we've added something um, uh, that does the chords. We've had we have drums. We have uh, uh, a lead, a melody, and we could add some audio to this uh, and do all sorts of things. Um, however, I I don't think we're going to do much more in this. <laughs> mm. And this part of tonight, uh, this is my second song, and I think I should be ready to export this. <clears throat> and we can do that in a number of different ways. Um, but maybe I would like to add some sort of an arrangement um, to this. So what if we started with uh, something like that? And maybe halfway through, 
So you can kind of see what I'm doing. These these are the blocks, the original box, and I'm kind of making a very quick arrangement. Uh, the question uh, about uh, stacked chord tracks, maybe you could try to do just a different versions. And so you can uh, add them just like you would add different takes and say a new version of the chords and then uh, move through them and uh, uh, get what you want that way. That might be a possibility. Uh, okay, I really need to run to the bathroom, but We'll see uh, and add my second song, version one. Uh, again, we're exporting this down. And what do we need to do? Well, we need to tell Cubase uh, what we would like to export. So I select everything and click P or hit P. And here again, I'm selecting the up channel. I'm exporting the locators and I'm using the wave uh, file uh, type to export and clicking export audio. And this might take a little bit longer and depending on, like, depending on your computer and the settings and everything, it might be quicker or uh, slower depending on what you are exporting. And just to, um, again, make sure and uh, where are we? Where are we? Uh, I closed it, that's why. So that's my first song is there. My second song is now here, great. <clears throat> very nice, very nice. So um, let's take a short uh, two minute break and uh, I'll be back very, very soon. All right? And here we are, here we are. Mm. Very good. Um, I'm just going to close down that and have a look at, uh, so that was uh, module two. Uh, we have in all, 
we have uh, five modules. So, so let's say we've we've done two fifths of uh, what I want to talk about tonight. So module three. Oh, oh, this is a heavy one. Now we're getting into a little bit more of the theory of things uh, and disclaimer I'm, I'm probably going to say something that's not 100% correct tonight I usually do uh, because I like to explain things in a way that is easy to understand for someone that's a complete beginner so if you're seeing this um, either right now live or afterwards uh, you're very welcome to uh, clarify things that um, I might um, be unclear about or uh, kind of add to what I'm saying. Just keep that in mind that I might phrase things differently uh, for someone that's a complete beginner and someone that has been working for a while. Plus, of course, I'm human, so I may I may misspeak. So disclaimer out of the way, uh, and let's let's get cracking with some of the more uh, advanced topics that we're going to go through. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, the signal flow. <clears throat> okay, and for this, I'm actually going to try, let me see, let me see how this is going to work out. Um, so this is now looking like this, okay. And if I hit F, no, let me see. This is very new for me. <laughs> but if we do this, this is now, very white and in this view I have no uh, let me see I have no need for the main screen let me see if we can turn that off there we go okay <clears throat> all right all right so uh, okay, the cancel, cancel. This is Photoshop, which I don't know anything about, almost, almost nothing. But I recently got a, like a, a graphic, a graphic tablet screen thingy, um, and which means I can do stuff like this, and a hand, age, and then B for brush. Uh, because no layers are selected. Okay, let's select a layer then. There we go. Okay, what about now? Yes, yes. Great stuff. So MIDI, let's talk about MIDI. We have used MIDI already and we've uh, pl played on a MIDI keyboard and I've kind of explained it a little bit, but I just want to go over it again in a little, little bit of detail. So say we have this uh, piano, right? We have, and I'm not going to draw the whole piano, but one black key, two black key, three black keys, right? So everyone can see that this is a piano, hopefully. So let's say that this is a MIDI piano. From the MIDI piano, the MIDI piano uh, sends a digital signal. At least when when uh, we're using uh, like modern MIDI uh, keyboards and it's sending uh, over USB, which is uh, uh, very common. So I'm just going to say USB, right? And it's sending its digital uh, digital signals to the computer. Okay. Right. This is a computer. And that's a very simple uh, signal chain because that's pretty much it. <laughs> We're gonna go through the audio, uh, uh, the audio chain afterwards. But for MIDI, it's pretty pretty simple. Um, however, what it sends uh, in here, it can be a lot of different things. So uh, we've already talked about like a uh, which which note it's actually playing, right? And we've talked about um, velocity. And if you can't remember what velocity did, it was how how hard your uh, and I can't even type velocity, uh, how hard you're clicking the individual keys. Okay, so 
I'll, I'll say in parentheses between 0 and 127 for some reason, right? That's the, the range uh, of how hard you're pressing it. Uh, it, it. It can go from 0 to 127. So in all, 128 different values. Now, that number uh, is, is uh, the same for a lot of different things that you can also send through MIDI. And I'm just going to mention a couple, um, a couple of them. So one of them would be sustain pedal. Sustain pedal. You can send information about w when the, the sustain pedal is uh, pressed down and when, it, uh, when you let go of it. And I'm also going to say CC number 64 in, in parentheses there. Um, what is CC then? CC is, uh, it stands for continue, oh, I'm probably going to uh, misspell this, continuous, continuous controller. <laughs> And there's all sorts of different numbers of uh, continuous controllers that you can uh, send over MIDI. So uh, CC number 64 is one example, and CC number one uh, is going to be the mod wheel, which <clears throat> um, you use for all sorts of different things depending on the instrument. But it's a something you can turn. I'm, I'm turning the mod wheel right now and it's sending different data. Uh, and you have other things like pitch band, you have, uh, you can send um, MIDI volume, you can send MIDI pan, um, expression, uh, and all sorts of different things. And for my work in media music, I use these a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. But uh, usually we're talking about these things. So we're talking about the sustain pedal, which note is playing and how hard you're playing it. And all of that gets sent to uh, the computer, Com computer, as I've uh, written it. Um, you can send stuff the other way as well. And, and sometimes you do that, uh, like for example, when I would use this guy, uh, like in a uh, physical synth, this guy would need MIDI in and, and not through a USB always. Uh, you can use a USB for this guy as well. But uh, the, uh, you also have like a MIDI input right here. <laughs> not sure how, how well that will show, but uh, you can send stuff uh, that way as well. So you can send MIDI in and MIDI out. Uh, but it's all digital um, and, um, oh, well, I'm I'm probably misspeaking because this this um, uh, this synth is fully analog. So just just tag along. <laughs> okay, it's a very simple signal chain, um, and that is what I'm going to say about MIDI. I believe. Yeah. So that's the signal chain. Now. Let's go a little step further um, and add a new, new thing. Um, and now I want to talk about audio. Right. So in the audio world, we have a lot of, uh, we have, I'm just waiting for it to update and see if it's going to work. Come on. Come on, I know you can do it. Sometimes it takes a while. <laughs> and this time it took uh, very long. There we go. Perfect. So, <clears throat> audio signal chain. It all starts with a microphone. Now we're going to talk about different microphones and, and, and not go super in depth about them. We're going to talk a little bit about them. 
So let's start with a mic. Um, I'm talking into this mic right now, and you guys are hearing the sound, and we're going to take you through the journey of that. We've talked a little bit about it. So from the mic, we're going to th go through a an XLR cable, which is a cable that has three cables inside of it, and uh, I'd love to show you uh, how that looks, but uh, I think you guys can imagine three cables. Um, <clears throat> two cables carry a signal, and the third is carrying uh, Earth. So, mm, from there, you'll go into a preamp. A preamp because this that signal that is being transported through that cable isn't very strong so you you'll need something to kind of boost boost it uh, to make it usable <clears throat> and you would need a preamp uh, whether or not you were going to use uh, uh, like Cubase to work on it uh, if you were using uh, a mixer for live live uh, for a concert you would also need uh, a preamp for that. So you just need to boost the signal to make it a, a good and healthy signal that you can work with. Okay, so that's the preamp. Now, after the preamp, uh, in our case, we're gonna move into a AD converter. Okay. Now, what is an AD converter, you may ask? Uh, well, an AD converter converts the signal from an analog signal, which is what this is. This is uh, voltage, right? And it, it converts that signal from from a uh, an analog signal into a digital signal. Now, what is a digital signal? That is a binary code. So, zeros and ones is what is the language that the computer understands. And when we, we are working in the digital domain, uh, we need to speak the same language, right? So we are converting it to. Uh, zeros and ones and zero zero one 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 and so on i i don't speak binary code natively sadly would be very helpful sometimes <laughs> maybe in the future um all right so after this point i'm just gonna just gonna write cubase because that is basically what we need to get the sound into Cubase. Uh, we need to translate it into a language that Cubase understands. And before that, we need to amplify the signal so that it's a good and healthy signal that we can work with. And that's it. And as I told you earlier, uh, these older uh, or these a little bit um, more like entry entry point interfaces will uh, have all of these things inside one box uh, but in my setup there are different boxes because that is how it's often broken broken down for studio grade uh, equipment okay so in cubase we do we do stuff to the uh, audio signal and we uh, fix some stuff we add some tools that we're going to learn about um, and afterwards what happens to make us able to, to hear this stuff? Well, it's very simple. Uh, we do a DA converter, right? And from there, we take the signal uh, that is already digital and we turn it back into voltage uh, and, and an analog signal. And after that, uh, we take that signal through some cables. Uh, I'm not going to say XLR because it, it can vary a little bit, but just say a cable. Um, and we're going to end up with a headset or a and speak 
a speaker. And that is the complete signal chain for audio. Obviously, obviously there's uh, more stuff happening inside of here and inside of here uh, that we could talk about and we probably will have to talk about. Uh, yes, let's talk about it now. Whew, okay, are you guys ready? Uh, it's gonna be a little bit nerdy. Just, just letting you guys know. Okay. Um, the good thing though is that we can we can Google stuff. We can Google stuff. So let's uh, talk about one thing first, which we haven't talked about yet. But we need to talk about. Oh, sorry if the mic is not working or like the volume is going up and down. We need to talk about sample rate. Okay, and I'm going to try to um, explain it in a simple way. Let's say CD quality. Quality. Uh, 44,100 hertz. Okay, uh, let's say film and TV. 48,000 hertz. Maybe you've seen those numbers before. Maybe those numbers mean nothing to you at all. Um, if, if we're going to have just have a look at Hertz, this is something we're going to talk more about when we talk about uh, the, the theory of sound. Um, but it means times per second. Second. So when we translate the signal from an analog signal that is voltage remember uh, over to a digital digital signal that has zeros and ones we, we are kind of uh, taking a snapshot of that sound wave and turning it into data like digital data and um, the data points that we are uh, measuring this by is is called the sample rate so for CD quality 44K or 44,100 Hertz um, is 44,100 data points per second about where the signal moves. Could just go up, up in the audio wave or down in the audio wave. Um, and obviously, you, you could kind of think that, oh, okay, so the, the higher the sample rate, the better quality then, right? Which is true, there's more data points uh, in, uh, there's more data points in 48,000 times per second than 44 time, 44,000 times per second, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> However, um, we could also say something pretty interesting here, so, um, if we divide this by two, you get the maximum um, frequency that you can uh, uh, play back within the rules of that sample rate. So uh, already with the CD quality, if we if you have a look at that, you get twenty two thousand and fifty hertz. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later, um, but, or are we? When are we going to talk about it? <laughs> I, I am just going to have a look at the next section. Yes, we're going to talk about it later. Okay. But for now, um, we can say, like the uh, range of human hearing is ranging from 20 hertz to 20 k hertz. Uh, so for 20 times per second, the, the sound wave will be uh, re resonating to 20,000 times per second. So already with the CD quality uh, f uh, sample rate, we are outside of human hearing uh, within the, uh, the, the ranges. 
<sighs> okay, so I'm, pr I'm probably going to get some comments uh, about uh, what about the super high res uh, sample rate that goes up to 192 kilohertz, for example. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> or 96, 96 kilohertz. Um, I would like you to point you to a video by FabFilter about um, about uh, what is it called? It's called what's it called? Super sampling. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. Um, my mind is a little. Let me see. Let's just Google it. So we are at YouTube uh, Fab Filter uh, uh, Sample Rate. Here we go. So <clears throat> it's a video called Sample Rates. The higher, the, the higher, the better, right? Which is a very, very it's a, it's a half an hour of of nerdiness. Uh, if you guys would like to watch watch it. And it's talking obviously about uh, oversampling. It's, is the, is what the name I was um, looking for. Oversampling, which you can find in some plugins that will artificially um, raise the sample rate. And there's some cool things uh, that can be gained from working in a higher sample rate. But for this course, um, I'm gonna say a big fat no there and <clears throat> another thing to be aware of is that if i if i'd like to change sample rates i'll add need to add in something i'm not going to explain it but you would need to add in something called dithering um, to the mix which will uh, help that transition by adding some noise <laughs> i'll do some noise shaping um and that can be a, a little bit much to to wrap your head around now in the beginning. So I would advise you to just keep the sample rate the same and keep. Um, oh, what did I just say? Did I? Did, yes. OK. OK. <laughs> Am I talking about sample rates or bit depth now? Yes, I'm sorry. I was I was uh, um, misspeaking again. So changing uh, sample rate, it's not that complicated, but it, you, you can get into all sorts of different kinds of trouble. Just think about uh, if you tell a program that this file is supposed to be played back at a speed of 44,100 data points per second. And now, um, now you tell it uh, to, uh, and then you give it a file that should should be played back with forty eight thousand data points per second. Then you're gonna uh, have a file that is either playing back uh, faster or slower than what it was recorded as, and um, if the program doesn't catch it, it can it can mean a lot of lot of trouble. Trust me, I've. I've done it all. <laughs> all right. So that was sample rate. Uh, just a little bit about sample rate. And now let me talk about boom, boom. Let me have a look. So we've talked about signal flow with MIDI and signal flow with audio and a little bit about sample rate. Um, let's let's talk about bit depth. All right. If we're talking about bit depth, uh, the most common things you're going to see is going to be 16, 16 bit, 24 bit. And sometimes you're going to see 32 bit float or even in Cubase you can see 64 bit float and I guess we can write 8 bit as well 
So to explain a bit depth, uh, we need to talk about dynamics. So um, let's talk about what would we call the difference between the loudest point in a signal and the lowest point. That range there we call the dynamic range. And um, the, 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 the higher the bit depth you have, um, the larger the theoretical dynamic range you can have in that signal before it turns into noise. So there's also some videos about this if you want to hear the difference um, by going playing the same song through with different bit depths, uh, which can be very helpful in understanding this. Or you could go to Wikipedia and, and read the numbers of the actual possibilities dynamically from as loud as it's possible uh, to as low as possible without with it still being measurable not not necessarily something you can hear but uh, that that it would show up in the data points uh, if we're talking um, about data points <laughs> so um 24 bit is the standard for working with the music production 16 bit is going to be uh, what we end up with um, on a CD, commercial CD. 24 bit, uh, stay here. Stay here for recording. Okay, and still uh, with if I'm if I'm changing any of these, I will need dithering. Um, so in the beginning, I am suggesting that you just stick to 24 bit. Now there's a difference between what the audio files themselves are at and what the program runs at. So Cubase, um, like in my setup now, Cubase runs in 32 bit float. This is something both Pro Tools and Logic also have started doing which means that uh, it, although the sound should have been distorting in inside of the program it won't uh, because it's running in a 32-bit float engine okay so just accept that fact and um, it will only distort once you export um, the file and play it back from another program if that was very hard to understand, I understand that. So maybe watch a couple of videos on it then and uh, and uh, let me know if it was still unclear and I'll get back to you in the comments. Okay, so to understand this, of course, we need to make sure that everyone knows that for digital audio, there's one rule above them all. Um, zero D b and it's supposed to be written like that if you were wondering uh, is the max okay so everything below zero db is like minus one minus two minus ten um, that's all good once you get to zero db in digital audio you can't get any further so what in reality happens uh, like if we open up another uh, like uh, because I'm so I'm so fond of drawing what actually happens is we have a sound wave right here and what happens if this is like the the uh, ceiling this is 0 dB so 0 dB and I can say that uh, what is E E for erase? So what actually happens is the information that was supposed to be there, but isn't because we're over the threshold. It's just going to be cut off, like with scissors. So so the waveform itself is going to look like this, and it's not going to sound good. That's one thing, um, but the information that was supposed to be there is actually lost. Um, there, there are 
um, tools you can use to kind of try to get something back and the computer will look at the waveform and, and try to uh, guess what the waveform would supposed to have uh, was supposed to sound like and then turn down the volume so that it can play it back but I wouldn't rely on such tools, definitely not in the beginning. These are not tools that um, come stuck with programs anymore. Um, um, I, I use a, a tool called uh, Rx from Isotope to help me with um, when I get stuff from clients or if I made a mistake myself. I often I often make mistakes. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> and I realized I didn't show you show you this, so <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to go back and show you it again. <laughs> there were no, uh, it hasn't updated yet. So while we're waiting for that, my beautiful, beautiful painting. There we go. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so this is what I meant. So the audio waveform, it's just going to be um, cut off at this at this point when we're working with digital. Okay, so there, digital, digital audio. Cool. Great stuff. Now, I'm going to talk more. Yes, this stuff is important, though. So um, we need to talk about mics, um, and I'm going to separate it into three boxes. So we have dynamic mics, we have condenser microphones and ribbon microphones. And there's some excellent uh, videos on YouTube about the differences of these. So have a look at those if you'd like. But I'm going to say, uh, for example, uh, if we say a sure SM57, an example of a uh, condenser microphone, I'm going to say a Neumann uh, U87 and for ribbon I'm going to say Royer what is it? Is it the letter as well? Let me see oh it's, it's an O it's, it's an E okay and it's just called R121, we also have different brands. So there's just some examples that might be familiar and might not be familiar at all. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> this is a marathon and I'm, I'm, uh, mm, I'm condensing 20 lessons into one sitting. So, <laughs> Thanks, thanks for keeping up with me. All right, so these are the different types of microphones. The dynamic microphone um, is the most common. It's the most uh, cheap microphone. It's very cheap to make. It doesn't need any form of power to be able to work. So it, it's, it's going to be working no matter if it has a cable in it or not because it works with, with a magnet and a coil that moves based on a... Uh, uh, what's it called? Diaphragm. Uh, it's the English word. I'm sorry. Some of these words will be harder to translate for me. But um, yes, no need for power uh, and cheap. And that's all I'm going to say. Look up some videos about um, different microphone types if you'd like. Okay, condenser mics, uh, the, the common different forms. This, I'm talking to a, a condenser mic uh, right now. This is a large diaphragm condenser microphone and you have also small diaphragm condenser microphones, which I usually call like a cigar mic. 
round and kind of looks like a cigar. So um, that's what I'm call I call them that. These guys need power. Um, and I'm going to say usually, I'm sorry for my bad writing, um, 48 volts. And if we have a short look at um, this interface, can you guys make it out? Maybe, maybe not. There's a button right here that says 48V. Uh, down here, <laughs> 48 V. And so uh, if I plugged a microphone in into this thing, I would be able to send out 48 volts, which would power the, uh, the circuit inside of that microphone and give me a signal back. Okay. So what is, what, what are some of the gotchas with this, this type of, of a thing? Well, um, to say in parentheses, um, expensive, it's expensive, um, but has a very strong signal. Okay, so it's very, very um, uh, practical to use this. Uh, on sources that um, that doesn't have a very strong signal in and of itself, and it also gives a very clean signal. It isn't too colored, uh, which is also very, very much nice. Um, what else can we say about the condenser? Uh, I, I would describe the sound as very natural. Okay. <clears throat> Diaphragm was absolutely pronounced perfectly. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Sixtecrete. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm pronouncing your name correctly either, but there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, the ribbon mic is a very, very cool microphone um, because it's it has a diaphragm, but it's, it's not... Um, it works a little bit differently. So the, the ribbon mics has a very, very small and thin metal plate that is resonating uh, within some magnets. So the magnets, again, uh, are pretty common here. <clears throat> and you can, uh, let me see. So, so let me see if I can draw it. So if we have one part of, with a uh, magnet and then we have a little very thin plate right here. And so what happens? Um, first of all, this plate of metal is super, super, super thin and will easily break. And that will in effect break the microphone. So you need to be super careful with these. Uh, and most of them will not handle um, uh, the phantom power, which is also another name for plus 48 volts, phantom power. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, this, this is the proven mic. Um, another characteristic, we haven't talked about this at all, but you could talk about different microphone patterns and what I'm not sure what it's called in English, but <clears throat> the, the, the like the umbrella term of this. Um, but in what way a microphone records audio is going to be different based on the polar pattern it's, it's called polar polar pattern. And the most common uh, way that a microphone is recording sound is going to be that it records from the direction that the diaphragm is pointing and then a little bit on the sides, but not too much uh, in the back. Okay. The ribbon mic works, works very differently. And that's the reason why I, I drew this because of the solid pieces of, of, of the magnets on the sides, right? 
it won't record anything from the left side or from the right side, but it will record stuff from the front and stuff from the back. And so in effect, it uses a different polar pattern from uh, most of the mics uh, in, a, in that it uses a figure eight uh, polar pattern. So it records what is directly in front and what is um, in, directly in the back, but not uh, to the sides of the mic, which is good to know and, and to be aware of if you're using a ribbon mic. Um, all right, enough of the theory. We are tired. You want to do something else? All right. <clears throat> I'm going to do something else. <sighs> Let's talk about recording uh, different things. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to open up uh, another project in Cubase in the background in case we need it. There we go. Um, and we're going to call it recording tech Leaks. Good. All right. So let's just uh, show this, this, and again, let's turn off the scribbly, scribbly, scribbly bits. Let me see which one that was. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so, in this world um, of recording a lot of different different things, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you much for the encouragement along the way. <laughs> I, I, I am actually following my my own. Um, my own notes here, and we're going to talk about uh, how to do a proper and good vocal recording. And in that space, we could talk about a lot of different things. Uh, we could talk about the difference between uh, getting a technically correct vocal recording, and, or we could talk about how to get the most out of a less than ideal recording space. Uh, and we can talk about what kind of a feeling we would like to give the performer and we kind of need to balance these three things a little bit what I'm, what do I mean by that like take this room for example that I'm sitting in now this is in my in my home I'm, I'm not sitting in a studio I'm, I'm not renting a studio anymore um, so I've been working um, out of this room for the past one and a half years actually um, doing freelance stuff and uh, working on my headphones. So I have uh, expensive speakers at my, st uh, my old studio. I just left them there um, because I know whoever is there now. So, so we have an agreement there. But um, this is not an ideal room at all. Um, the walls are, of, uh, are concrete walls and there's a large glass behind me. And I still I would choose to be here any day of the week because there is a garden behind me and I can open up and get some fresh air and those kinds of things do matter a lot. So you kind of maybe have to make some compromises sometimes. That is also true for when you're recording vocals. I get questions from time to time from students that are recording in their bedroom, for example, um, recording vocal and wondering how they can get a better sound. And of course I could be telling them things like put the pillow, uh, put the uh, yeah, a pillow over your head. It's not called the pillow, but the large part. <laughs> um, and you're going to get a much drier sound, which is going to help you kind of treat the signal afterwards. Uh, I could tell them that, but I would also tell them that the performance is the most important thing, right? So are you giving the best performance when you have a, a pillow over your head or when you can look out the window at the beautiful view out from your bedroom, right? I'm, I'm trying to give that thought 
uh, to them. And so I'll, I'd like to pass that thought off to you as well. Um, however, with that being said, um, there's a there's another difference between condenser mics, which is, for example, the one I'm talking into now, and a d dynamic mic, which is that a dynamic mic will be much um, easier to work with in a less than ideal room, because it's it's more like um, 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 direction dependent. It's and it's it's not the completely right word, but I think you understand what I mean. <clears throat> so that uh, I won't hear as much of the reflections from the walls if I use a dynamic mic um, compared to if I use a mic like this. So I should probably be talking into a different mic and I have uh, other mics I just but I just love this mic uh, because it has very little noise in it so um, that's also why you're hearing some <clears throat> some of the sounds from my kids and uh, if my wife is on a phone call you'll hear it I won't hear it as much because I have a headset on but there you go <clears throat> I'll give you some very quick rules or or tips to go by i would uh try to always use a pop filter this is a pop filter let's see if i can kind of show it it looks like this something like this um some of them look a little bit different these are record recordy something not sure how to pronounce it what this is going to do is it's going to stop the airwaves from when you're, you're um, saying uh, consonants that bring with it them a lot of air. So, for example, a, a P sound, the consonant P has the beginning of that p -p 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 sound and then there is a gust, gust of air uh, that is going to hit the microphone and result in low frequency noise um, because as we're going to get to soon uh, sound is air set in motion that's the definition of sound and so um, the use of a pop filter or something to kind of stop those kind of uh, kinds of airwaves is really really important because it's not that easy to get rid of afterwards uh, so I would advise you to try to get your hands on a pop filter if you're in a pinch you can try to use a sock and and take that over the microphone <laughs> and usually that's gonna work if you're using um, uh, I got a question um, uh, not too long ago like uh, what if i'm using like a sure sm58 do i still need to use a pop filter and the answer is no because it already has a pop filter inside of it if you remove the cap on the on that microphone and look inside you'll see that there is actually uh, some foam there that is doing the same kind of job so um keep that in mind so a lot of dynamic mics have these kinds of things already in order. Uh, and so I'm talking more about people using a, a, a condenser microphone for, for these kinds of things. And also, I'd like to uh, teach a little bit about the difference in distance between the mic and the sound source. And now, right now, we're talking about vocals. So I, I try to picture like the, the, the length of my thumb, this length, and I think that's approximately 10 centimeters. I try to use that as a starting point for when I'm recording vocals. Knowing that if I move closer, I'll get a more intimate sound and I'll also get more bass sound as I move closer than if I, if I move further away, I'll get gradually and gradually less bass than if I move closer to the mic. All right. Um, and other than that, uh, people uh, like vocalists that have been singing a lot in the studio know how to kind of move a little bit uh, and play with that distance to get more 
uh, out of the end of a phrase to get more bottom end on a part of the song or a, a, like a note that inherently doesn't have too much bass in it. And that is something to practice and to coach uh, when you have other uh, other people um, in the in the studio. Yes, it, the sock is um, probably it's not going to be your best option because you're probably going to lose a lot of the uh, uh, top end as well. You're going to lose something, but um, but it can be very very helpful uh, in getting rid of the p -p 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 sounds which uh, you, you're probably still hearing it when I'm exaggerating it uh, with, with this uh, pop filter because I'm very close uh, to the mic. There you go. Okay. Um, so that was a little bit about vocal uh, miking. Hmm. Do I have that? Yes, we have an acoustic. We have an acoustic guitar. too bad. Uh, so this is an acoustic guitar and I'd like to talk very briefly about how I would go about miking a, an acoustic guitar. If I have one mic, I usually place the mic right here, pointing right here. And for some guitars, uh, uh, some guitars will have a like a pick board uh, right here. Um, and so I, I like to point it right there. Uh, one might think that if when I have like an acoustic guitar, why wouldn't I point the sound, point the mic at where the sound is coming from? So why wouldn't I point the sound directly at the the uh, resonating hole? And the reason is that you, you will get, if you do that, you'll get some frequencies that resonate more than others. And so that will not give you a, a, like a flat sound of what is actually played. So that is why uh, you can point it at, uh, you can point it at literally everywhere around the sound, the sound hole. I like this this place right here because I feel like um, I, I'm not very much in the way of the uh, guitarist if I place a mic there. And uh, if I have two mics, I also uh, like to point a, uh, usually a small diaphragm condenser at the 12th fret. We could talk a lot about the 12th, 12th fret uh, because it's very interesting. It's the midpoint between the uh, start and the end of the string. I, I don't know these words in English. I'm sorry. Um, so that's also the point where you can get an octave, for example. And uh, so if you think about the string as a thing that is vibrating, each string is vibrating up and down then the midpoint of those two points is going to be the point where the string is moving the most, right? Because at the very end, it's going to be a lot more stiff than at the, the exact middle point. And so based on that, I am deducting, like you'll get a lot of the tone and meat from placing a mic right there. And so the way of thinking that I'm talking about now where I'm using a multi microphone setup to record one sound source is a very common thing in, in music production. And we're thinking about these multiple microphones as filling different roles, not as being one mic for the left speaker and one mic for the right speaker. But rather than that, uh, they're they're creating a sound together and capturing different different aspects of the sound, and together we can make a mix of the different microphones um, and end up with one sound. So that is very common. Uh, 
That is uh, vocals and acoustic done. Um, let's talk about uh, source of percussion just very quickly. If I have a shaker or anything, uh, I, I would love to record that with a, a large diaphragm microphone and just keep your distance a little bit. Um, as long as the what you're recording percussion wise is not too loud, then you can you can use a condenser microphone for that. Um, the condenser microphones uh, will distort if this, the signal that it's trying to record is too loud. And this is, this is a different distortion than w what we've talked about earlier with a digital distortion and we're, we're cutting the tops of the audio waves uh, in the digital domain. This is a distortion of the diaphragm itself. <clears throat> So if you have a look at uh, online um, and have a look at uh, a, a large diaphragm mic, uh, it will say somewhere uh, in the specifications, it will say SPL and then a number in decibels. SPL stands for sound pressure level. Um, and there's a limit to what those kinds of mics can withstand before they will distort the signal and then no matter what you do later on in the chain it will still sound distorted because it's the diaphragm itself that's distorting <clears throat> okay so for for very loud percussion sources like a snare drum or a drum set it's a lot it's a lot more common to use um, dynamic mics for the close mics if you if you have the microphones very close to the source and, and then for the, maybe for the overhead, for the overall sound of the drums, you would use uh, like a small diaphragm condenser mic uh, or a ribbon mic or a set of ribbon mics, preferably. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm gonna go through, we could, we could talk about piano, uh, like a, a acoustic piano, and we could talk about el guitar. Um, I'm going to talk about, yes, I'm going to talk about both of them, <laughs> but now I want to draw a little bit again. I want to draw a little bit. So let's have a look at the piano. <clears throat> uh, and I, I did something here. I'm not sure. Okay. So I'm not sure what happened. Why did we change? I want, I want you. Okay, I'm not sure what the settings are. I don't know Photoshop. <laughs> Opacity, 100%. And then the flow, maybe, maybe that's the one. Uh, and then you. Okay, what about you? So now nothing's working apparently. I think it's thanks to this guy. Okay, good enough. And let's do this. Boom. Act like nothing happened, guys. I'm erasing. Okay. So for the piano, um, let's say we have a, uh, this is going to be a beautiful drawing, by the way. So we have a piano. This is piano. Bloop, 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 bloop. Okay. There is a possibility um, to take off some panels on the piano. <clears throat> yeah yeah awesome awesome i'll try i'll try so these will be very simple setups but uh, i'm going to talk about not a grand piano but an upright piano which i believe is a lot more common for people starting out so there's a lot of different panels you can uh you can remove on a, a upright piano for example you can uh, open the lid 
this guy, right? Could get rid of that. There's also like a front panel right here. So this would be where all of the keys were, right? And so on, blah, 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 blah. And so you you would be able to remove that panel and that will be show you the, the beautiful um, in, inner, uh, all, all of the stuff that's inside the piano. <laughs> all right. Um, and then you would also be able to take off this panel at the underside and that would uh, show you the pedals and also show you more of the the uh, the, the metal plate that's holding the uh, holding the strings in place which by the way is withstanding between 18 and 20 tons of force so that's a lot and and a fun fact but very interesting <laughs> um For live use, very often you see a setup where uh, where you have two mics that you place. It would, uh, just open the lid a little bit and, and place the mics inside. One on the left side and another on the right side. And uh, that that is perfect for live use because you often have more than that piano on stage. Maybe you have a drum set or a guitar player or a vocalist. And for the live sound engineer, you're trying to get as much isolation between the different tracks uh, as possible so that you can treat them more individually. Uh, so I believe that is why you often see that kind of setup for upright pianos live in the studio. It's a little bit different because we're able to remove stuff and by doing that, getting in a more open sound and getting closer to the hammers of uh, when they're striking the strings in the piano. So I very often like to start off with a microphone right here and here. And you might be asking then, oh, and now it kind of looks like a, a box with a smiley face or not a smiley face never mind um, you might be asking why wouldn't you have something here in the ends to kind of capture the whole range of the piano and i'm answering that by saying the like the the outer ends of the piano is very often not used at all for, for songs and so I would place it right here but then reserve the right to move it based on what I'm what I was recording so if there is no information out here in the sides then why would I um, kind of give up on the possibility of uh, uh, making something closer to the swords uh, where we where the pianist is playing more if you kind of get what I'm what, what I'm saying so uh, if you like the hammer sounds for example uh, if you're 20 centimeters away from from the actual hammers that are being used in the song then you're not going to get that close hammer sound um, just so you know that so that is why I kind of try to put them outside of the shoulders of the pianist but then uh, so that they're not in the way uh, of that player and and if possible you can try to have the mic stand on the other side so that it goes down like this right and then goes down here um, and that's a very nice way of doing it you can also put some mics right here to get more of like a pedal sound uh, which is very, very uh, common to do. I, 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 I hate pedal noises myself, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I uh, don't often mic the pedals in that way, but if you removed that panel, then uh, you would be able to, to get more of those kinds of noises. Um, obviously, you're also able to record uh, sounds from the, from the actual player, uh, if if he has a like a 
creaking uh, uh, chair. So, some some people like that to give it more of like a, an authentic uh, sound of things. And also, I'd like to express the possibility of testing out stuff. So I, I do this uh, with my students. So we place a mic on the back side of the piano. There is a, a wooden um, wall there. So I'm going to say woody sound. Uh, useful question mark. And it's going to uh, kind of mark uh, one important point of my teaching when we're doing uh, actual recording in a recording studio, which is that I might have some mics like this one and this one that are um, giving me a a, a bass sound to work to work from all right so i i know that these two mics will give me a great sound i might add in the pedal if i like the pedal not pedal sound maybe i have some room mics in addition <clears> that <throat> maybe they're here you know and once i have that i'm I'm, I'm kind of confident that I'll I will get a usable sound. So after that, I can place mics. That's just gonna be experimentation, and give me, um, give me an experience of a setup. So m maybe I will try this uh, with one mic one time, and it will sound horrible. And maybe I will try it again next time with another mic and it will sound completely different on a different song with a different piano player. And so I try to, to kind of group stuff in a bass sound that I trust in uh, that, that feels safe. And then I'll try to experiment a little bit outside of that. And I think if you continue to do that, you'll learn. And at the same time, you'll have fun and you'll, you'll always do something different, which is also important in, in working in the studio environment because it's very easy to fall into the trap of, I know how to get a piano sound, right? So there, therefore, I'm, I'm not going to test anything new. I'm not going to read online of how other people like to record the pianos because I know how to record a piano. You know, <laughs> and if you keep that mindset, I don't think you're gonna progress uh, much more than you than uh, where you think you are at the moment. All right, just uh, today's coaching. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about, um, and I'm just gonna create a new layer before I switch over. So here we go, boom. Let's talk a little bit about guitar. And, and, and right now I'm talking not about acoustic guitar, but an electric, electric guitar. So I'm just going to draw a guitar amp because um, we're not, uh, we're not recording the, um, the acoustic sound of an electric guitar. There's no, it's not much point to that. This is the speaker. Just, just follow my lead with my horrible uh, drawings. All right. <clears throat> So, uh, I'm not going to try to, okay, I'm going to try to draw a guitar. This is very, very much an L guitar, just so you guys know. Boom, and then, beautiful, right? Very, very nice. And I can do some straight lines as well. Very nice. There you go, that's an electric guitar. So out from the electric guitar, we'll, we'll go there, right? But there's also another possibility, which is to go via a DI box. Um, the DI box <clears throat> will translate a signal from an unbalanced signal, which is what comes from an electric guitar, to a balanced signal, in a, uh, and most commonly also change the the cable type from a jack to an XLR. All right. 
if you have, um, if you do this, there's also another output from that DI box that says, uh, so let's first take the XLR, XLR, and say balanced, balanced, okay? There's also another output from that DI box that says through, T-H-R-U usually, and that is still a unbalanced jack signal. So that is just a, a signal that goes through without it being uh, being changed in any way. So the workflow would often be to record uh, track uh, one di and then number two amp uh, with a mic. So you would put a mic on the amp, obviously, <clears throat> but the advantage of doing that would be that I would still have this dry signal coming directly from the electrical guitar, which will, would mean that I could take that signal on a later date and push it out from Cubase into another amp and get a different signal because I would still have the dry signal before it was sent to the amp. Uh, which is very common and it's called reamping. So that is a, a way of of um, getting a better safety <laughs> in your recording sessions to do that. Uh, and it's it's not it's not. Uh, let me see. I actually have a DI here. It's right here. So you can see the balanced output right here, which we were talking about, which would be an XLR and an unbalanced output or a link, which will do pretty much the same thing. And then the input would be the uh, signal from the electrical guitar, right? Nice. Uh, yes. And so when we're miking, a guitar amp you could do that with one mic two mics three mics and so on and again I'd like to talk about the concept of uh, each mic having a different role and in, in capturing different aspects of the what you're recording so a very common combo is a sure SM57 and then a condenser. Okay. Or a ribbon. <clears throat> now, what would be the roles? Um, what would be the roles of these different mics? Do you think if you were if you were to guess, it might not be self-explanatory if you haven't heard what what a Shure SM57 sounds like. So I'm just gonna explain it. The Shure SM57 doesn't really sound that good. Uh, in itself, but it heightens some frequencies and, and cuts others in a way that makes it cut through the mix in a way that almost no mic before it has ever done <laughs> or after. Uh, and that's why it's one of the most sold microphones in the world. Um, and it's very much a mic that is used in the studio and also live on electrical guitar, on a guitar amp. <clears throat> um, because of that uh, kind of um, the effect that it has that it cuts through the mic, mix, uh, cuts through, through the mix. And so we have a, a another microphone that is going to work a little bit um, oppositely, 
if you can say that. So you have a condenser that is going to sound rich and full and beautiful, but maybe not cut as much through the mix. And a little bit of the same with a ribbon microphone. A ribbon microphone is going to sound a little bit more warm and vintage y than a condenser microphone. A condenser microphone is going to sound a little bit more hi-fi and have a lot more of the crisp crispness up top. But you can choose um, a, a, an SM57 and a, condens a condenser or a ribbon. And I hope you can see the different roles I'm talking about here. So one for making it cut through and be a little bit sharp and edgy and one mic for for it being nice. And then imagine that you now have two faders and you can kind of mold the sound by turning one up and the other down, right? And we haven't used any tools yet. We haven't talked about any tools yet in this session, uh, which is uh, frightening to me. <laughs> but we haven't, um, uh, so you're not using an EQ or a compressor or anything, but you're just moving the relationship between these two roles of capturing the, uh, the sound source, right? Okay, so back to it here. Uh, one thing that you guys need to know when recording an amp is uh, how do you get specific sounds? So <clears throat> what's the difference of placing a mic right here and right here? And I sometimes get this thing mixed up myself. But if we think about it in like a logical way, <clears throat> uh, for the outer end of the of the uh, speaker cone, you're gonna get uh, get more low end because again, the the uh, uh, the speaker isn't as stiff just like when we talked about the, the um, guitar string as isn't as stiff as it is in the middle towards the end. So you're gonna get a lot more beefy sound and, and uh, also a more muddy sound can be uh, towards the outer rim. And towards the center, you're gonna get a lot more uh, edgy sounding things. And it can also sound a little sharp. But that's also where you're going to get the most top end. So there's no uh, there's no secret sauce uh, like a sure of, this is the way I always do it. But I follow these rules and try to uh, listen because each amp is different. If the amp has tubes, these tubes will sound different depending on if they're old or should be replaced. Uh, the guitar. It sounds enormously different, uh, one guitar to another guitar and another one player to another player. It sounds also completely different. So there's no way uh, to, to, to give you like an, um, uh, how do you, how do you say, um, like a list to follow, <clears throat> but I can give you some concepts. Okay. So from your description, would it be like condenser for body and dynamic for enhancer layers and sibilance effects? Uh, no, um, I would I would say that a condenser would be awesome for sibilance and, and the crispness up top. So if, if we have a look at like a frequency spectrum, boom, boom, uh, and say like, this is an EQ. So here we have 20 Hertz and here we have 20 K. Then I would kind of um, give the uh, dynamic characteristic, characteristic blah, 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 of kind of being somewhere in this neighborhood while the, while the uh, condenser would be something like this, right? And I can prove this by going to this view and and kind of, uh, so you can see this for yourself if you um, go to find uh, a Shure SM57 frequency uh, response. 
go to images and look right here. So this is the sound of the SM57. Op let's open that image in a new tab and make it a little bigger. All right. And find another one. Uh, let's do a Neumann U87. I'm starting to talk in Norwegian. And open that image in a new tab. Boom. And just look at the difference. So right here, it's, it's a lot steeper and if, the fall it falls off a lot earlier. And you can see that it's a, a big peak in uh, a range where where you would characterize the sound as sharp or edgy or uh, like it would cut through the rest and then it cuts off at the top end while the uh, U87 <clears throat> which is a large diaphragm microphone just has a little boost at the top and it's also a, a little higher in frequencies than the SM57. Now, uh, just complete for completeness sake, let's just do the Coles 4038 frequency response, which is a ribbon mic. And we can look at it right here and see that it has a lot more low end um, and cuts off a little bit earlier. So it's, it, it's gonna sound rounder and more buttery uh, than than a, uh, a condenser microphone. So that is how I would describe uh, the differences between them. But uh, um, if you have a microphone, uh, just write the name of the microphone and then frequency response. It should also um, be in the box that comes with the mic itself. But uh, you can learn a, a thing or two about what mics you actually have uh, by doing that. Um, and I. At the same time, I don't want you guys to be uh, become too analytical uh, because we still need to listen to this stuff. Uh, so uh, the, uh, being able to put on a headset that is closed, not open back like this one, and have only the mic that you are going to be placing in your ears and then moving the mic around uh, to try to find the, the sound that you want is a very, very cool exercise. And uh, I think most people that start doing music production nowadays, now I sound really old, um, aren't doing that enough. Okay, so you can dramatically change what you're recording just by moving the mic a couple of centimeters or an inch. Uh, and so, uh, or tilting it a little bit. Right, so getting to know the mics that you do have uh, will will be able to give you amazing results. Um, more than probably buying another mic will be able to do for you. <sighs> mic dropped. Um, so I'm I'm of course uh, an addict of gear, as everyone else that does music. So I'm 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 probably preaching as much to myself, to everyone else, but now I've said it. Uh, okay, so we've talked about vocals, acoustic guitar, percussion, piano, and L guitar, and by doing that, we've done a lot of, um, we talked about a lot of different concepts as well. So I'd like to move into um, talking a little bit about editing vocal uh, inside of Cubase and um, yeah, which is something I haven't really done that much. Uh, I've been doing that predominantly in Pro Tools for when I'm doing large uh, albums and projects. And the stuff I do now is more mixing. So so, so uh, the most of the editing is done already when I get the files, but uh, we'll, we'll manage to, to uh, sort, this up, sort this stuff out. Um, but I need to go to the bathroom again. So I'll, we'll have another two minute break and I'll be uh, back again. All right, see you then.
Oh, okay. <clears throat> I saved you guys from all the smacking noises from eating a little snack. Okay. Let's go here. And uh, let's try to find some uh, some audio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But doom boom boom. Where are you? Um, no, I don't want to open a project. I want to add these files. So I think we are here. Here we are. Different tracks. Let me add these guys in. So what I did just now is I'm just adding in some files because we, we don't want to spend a lot of time recording stuff. So I'm, I'm just going to use um, a project that I've done earlier. I'm going to select everything, go to bar one uh, by clicking shift P and uh, going, going to bar one, control L will move everything that I've selected, the starting point from, from what I've selected to the point where the playhead is. <clears throat> okay, and we have some things to do here. These guys, I don't think. Oh, oh, that, I, I, I saw it. Nope, nope. That was me, but it wasn't in Norwegian. And so there we go. Uh, so this is the clock track. Okay. We are going to use the U as well, but it's not the same track. So let, let's just have a listen to what we're going to be working on for the next little while. Oh, that was super loud. First of all, select everything. F3 to open the mixer. Alt shift in Cubase activates Q link, which means what I do to one track will happen to everything selected. So I'm just going to turn the volume way down. That was a commercial for a uh, Christmas commercial. Um, here we have a lot of different vocals. We have a lot of different vocals. So let's see if we can't work with these a little bit. <clears throat> All of these, I'm going to add them into the folder. That's also a custom key command, but you can set up yours if you want. Uh, I'm going to say vocals um, and just select the other guys and say the rest and then close it down. So we only have vocals here. I want to just add another audio track. I want it to be, I think I need it to be stereo for this to work just, just uh, for right now. Harpagliss is going to be in the rest folder. Okay. In Cubase, you can add different versions of a track. And that is very often how I do the different takes in, in, in a folder. Um, 
Those dynamics seemed incredible to my inexperienced Gimel. Oh, oh, well, it's not mixed at all. Uh, so we're going to mix it as well uh, tonight, just doing a quick, quick little mix. Um, so, for example, the, the ending here is all, all horrible um, with the voicings and stuff. But uh, we'll see, we'll see. <clears throat> Happy to hear that you liked it, though. Okay, so I'm just going to artificially add some of these uh, to this track. So I'm, I'm going to uh, copy the, copy it over, and I'm going to say Control-Shift-N. I'm not sure if that is uh, a, um, a standard key command or not, but it works for me. Uh, there we go. And control, control shift N. Let's do a couple of these as well. And then one more. Great. Now it says V8. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you add another uh, version, track version, which you can do by, by clicking this button right here and say, say new version, or you could duplicate the current version, which is also very, very cool. Um, you get a, a, an incremented number, very easy. All right, and I've set up my key commands as being um, control shift G to go back through these and control shift H. So I use G and H for, for a lot of different things, <laughs> okay? Um, this is helpful. You can uh, organize these in lanes instead. And so if I click lanes, it's gonna... So I think this is how it's uh, meant to be used, the different, the different takes of a vocal. So imagine uh, we have... Uh, here you go. So if we go here, we have the vocal number 10. Okay. So maybe this is the way I was supposed to do it. Never used lanes in my life. Let me see. It still looks like add Clean up lanes. How about <laughs> mm. I apparently need to learn a little bit about lanes. So I'm just gonna keep to the way I usually do things and someone can tell me in the comments. Um, because I usually do it this way. So there is often like ten different ways of doing things in uh, the different programs. So um, this is very close to what Pro Tools looks like, and that's why I probably do it in this kind of way. And so I, I often just add another uh, instrument track or, or duplicate uh, a version of a track, and then I would go through and so maybe solo that track and say that this is vocal take number one. just for our saneness sake, I'm just gonna make that track mono so, so that we hear. Okay, so let's say that that is one version and we can go back in time and listen to another one. Okay, and the way I would do stuff is kind of just pick stuff and then go back and maybe say that I like this part best from that and I would like this part as well. And so I would kind of cut stuff out from one, uh, one collection of takes to find, to make a best of track. Is, is what I call it. And um, it's very effective in g 
getting the most out of the source material, it can also be a, a very effective way of killing the performance that you're ending up with. Um, and so it's something to be aware of while working like this, um, that you need to be aware of what you're looking for when listening. And that takes a lot of practice. Um, my, my, first, uh, my first job when starting a studio uh, was to help out on a, um, a double album um, of, a, of a choir. And that, in, in, that, that job meant that I had to record and edit vocals for six, between five and six hundred working hours. Um, and through that kind of baptism of fire, um, I got very good at listening for the right things because very simple things like being a little off pitch, being a little bit high in pitch uh, or a little low in pitch is easy to easy to kind of nudge in place afterwards. That's not important at all. Uh, what you're kind of looking for is a performance, right? Um, and and whether or not you, you think pitching a vocal is ethical or the correct way of doing things. Um, my point still stands that the performance uh, trumps everything. So I would much rather have a note that is um, a little low in pitch, but still kind of moves me. Uh, and that is important to have that kind of a mindset, I think, uh, when you're do doing vocal editing in a way like this. Because if you're not, uh, then you might end up with a result that might sound correct, but has no soul left in it, if you, if you catch, catch my drift. All right, so that is a very simple um, look into um, the whole choosing process, uh, like what to think about, how to, how to maybe do some of it. Um, and uh, we're going to talk now about, let me see, we're going to talk now uh, about how to move stuff. So <clears throat> this is interesting. We haven't talked about that. Uh, well, wh what I've, what I have told you is that you're able to click and drag stuff to move it back and forth. But very often you would like to move stuff in, in smaller increments or in uh, increments that are rhythmical. And so I'm going to show both of them. Um, if we zoom in a little bit and have a look at moving stuff in small increments, if I select something and, and click control, right click now, we're going to move by one bar. Exactly. And you can see that uh, with the starting point. And the reason uh, why it's doing that is because I've set the grid to use quantize and the quantize is set to one whole bar. All right. Now, if I set the grid to something else, if I, if I set it to not use quantize, but to uh, use the beat, it's not going to move one quarter note. It's not. Okay. <laughs> I spoke too soon. So it's still using the quantize uh, uh, note value. Okay. I learned something today. Um, so if I select 64, fourth note is going to move in very small increments. Now that might not be uh, small enough for you. So a trick that I do sometimes <clears throat> is to uh, is to change the way that Cubase sees this project from a musical point of view to a uh, like a, a film and TV point of view. And you can do that um, right here, where it says select primary time format. There's probably great ways of doing this, right? This is just my way. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I select uh, time code 
instead of bars and beats. And now if I move stuff back and forwards, forwards I'll, I'll actually move them in frames. If you see down, down here in the time code, I'm moving by alt clicking, uh, alt or option clicking and plus, plus and minus on the keypad. Uh, but if I use the control and right and left arrow keys, I'm moving it within that same amount. So <clears throat> sometimes I do that. And then again, if I want to, I can just zoom in and just move it a little bit, right? And what if I'm not able to do that? If I'm right here and I see that it's still moving in increments, then I know that the snap is on, which which you which you can you <laughs> which you can turn off or on by hitting J the J key. Okay, <clears throat> my voice is cracking. I need to press on. So um, that is that is uh, good, but I want to talk you to you about this menu right here. Um, specifically the the uh, two um, utmost options in this menu. Um, you have a grid and a grid relative. What is the difference? I'll show you the difference and try to keep it as, as simple as possible. So if I have a look at this um, region right here, I've set the uh, quantize note value to a full bar. If I move this uh, and with the snap on, remember, it's going to move to the closest bar, right? But I don't know if you can see this, but I'm not moving a full bar. I'm moving to the closest um, note value that I have selected here, right? But first time I move it's only like half a bar and the next time it's a full bar and so the difference between grid and grid relative is that if I am in grid relative mode I'm always going to move that note value no matter how it's where the audio region is going to end up right so again just to show the difference if I am in grid mode the first time I move it it will snap to the to, to the nearest bar. But if I set it to grid relative, it's going to move by that note length, no matter what. Okay, when do you need what then? Well, <clears throat> if you want to move this vocal thing to the end of the song, uh, or the next chorus, for example, you, you'd like that dubbing to, to be in the in the in the next chorus as well, then a grid relative would probably be the correct option because then it's going to be in the in the same rhythmical position relative to um, to the note value that you've selected. But if you're, for example, working with um, a drum set uh, MIDI region and you're moving uh, a, a, a snare drum, then you might want that to snap to the nearest uh, note value and not kind of move because because you played it wrong and you just want to fix one of the notes and want it to be smack bang on um, the correct place. Um, so that's two different examples of when you would want the different um, modes. Um, there's different modes here as well. Um, like events shuffle is very, very nice to use shuffle if you're doing podcast editing because it deletes the, it, it moves the stuff that's forward in the timeline and, and kind of moves it up to where you deleted something. I can just show you. So shuffle, we'll do this. Right here, you can see that it will move this part over here which is very, very helpful <clears throat> if you're, for example, doing podcast editing or cutting down some <clears throat> voiceover or something. 
Um, so the and and likewise the event will say that I'll move move this. Uh, oh, I thought I thought. Okay, I'm not sure what events does. Okay, I'll need to read up on that. And cursor, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure. But uh, I, I usually leave this on either grid or grid relative. Good. Okay, that is done. Moving stuff is now done. We're going to talk about editing. Uh, and and see if we can get a, an example of a bad cut right here. So we're listening to this this thing. Okay, and again, we're going to do that. It wasn't too bad, but if we, if I play it back once again, you'll kind of hear a little pop just at that transition between these two regions. All right, I'll zoom in as much as I can. And have a look. So here's the wave file. And if we make this a lot bigger, Come on. Okay. So you can kind of see here that the waveform, and here you can actually see the individual data points or the individual samples as well, which is might be interesting. I can also kind of do this uh, with this little slider right here and what that does is not uh, raise the volume but it just kind of amplifies the the signal so so that it, it's easier to see <clears throat> okay so right here um, you can see that in this transition um, there's a very clear break where the audio waveform suddenly jumps up and that will create uh, that kind of a noise so if I make this worse like this, uh, we should hear a more definite pop. Okay, so I need to zoom way out. Right. So. There we go. And if I now try to move it so that it fits and try to play that back. We actually, I, I can't audibly hear a pop right now, um, which is interesting, but that kind of makes sense, right? So should, should you do it this way then uh, to always zoom way in on every little cut that you make and try to make stuff um, um, just play without any other tools or techniques no that would take <laughs> way too much time <clears throat> so what you do instead is you use fades and cross fades um, another example of, of what often happens is this kind of a thing uh, so right so we cut the uh, cut the sound because we need it to be gone but it <laughs> you kind of get this vacuum feeling uh, because it, it the sound has no gradual uh, volume uh, diminuendo, but it just suddenly d disappears, <clears throat> okay? So in Cubase, there is uh, some awesome ways to add fades. So again, if I hover over the audio event or the audio region, as I've probably uh, called it lots of times, you get these small triangles at the uh, top left and top right corner. And if you click and drag there, you'll actually be adding uh, a fade. So I can do that here as well, but that is not what I want to do. I, I don't want to create this thing. 
right? I want it, want it to fade between each other and that's called a crossfade. And the best way that I have found to do that is to change the tool to the range selection. Uh, and by the way, to, to, to switch between all of these, just use the number keys, not on the keypad, but over your uh, QWERTY keyboard, right? And you get all of these different things. I've, I've optimized some of them, so uh, they might not be the same as yours, but uh, number two is the same, and it's the range select selector. So I just select uh, over a, uh, like a, from one clip, from the ending of one clip to the beginning of the other, and I hit X, X for crossfade. And if I hit X again before doing anything else, I'll actually get a window that will enable me to, to uh, and you can kind of see the results down there. So I can say that I want more of the beginning or more, more of the old track or more of the new track. And I want that thing to look like this or look like, like you can do all sorts of stuff. Uh, this is not gonna sound good. <laughs> but um, usually I just select it, X and back to one and, and off, off you go. Uh, and here I can add a fade. So other ways to do this is I can click shift, shift and scroll wheel uh, from the beginning of the uh, audio region or shift, oh, I can't do it here, but I can do it here, shift or scroll wheel at the uh, the ending of the of the um, audio region if it's selected. And then it will add a, uh, here I believe it's gonna be dependent on, yes, dependent on the uh, uh, note length, at least if use quantize is on, yes. So if it's, so this is dependent on this setting, right? So I always have this on used quantize, but <clears throat> there you guys see that there's lots of possibilities to do this. So I often have it on this setting and then I I can select, yeah, I want, want a little bit of fade there and I can move on, I want a little bit of fade there. Okay, and boom, and a little bit there and maybe a little bit longer on that one and so on. Maybe I should uh, explain the other things while we're at it. So for this one, if I have multiple audio files, um, let's let's do this kind of thing. If I, if I have multiple audio files, I can choose between or select the different ones right here uh, by, by clicking this arrow. Um, I don't use that at all. But what I do use a lot is this square thingy, which is the gain. So it's the individual gain for for that specific region. It has nothing to do with the audio fader, um, but it enables me to kind of pre-mix stuff. If I know that, oh, I know that this part of the phrase is a little low in volume, so I'm just gonna raise it. And how did I do that? Well, that's the other amazing part, is that you can use the mouse wheel uh, to do this. So if you have something selected, can scroll up or scroll down to, to raise or lower the gain, which is, <clears throat> uh, is this going to be possible for me to follow from quick? <laughs> well, um, yes, I believe it's the, uh, it's the uh, first, first course in music production for, for my students at university. But uh, we're four and a half, four and a half hours in, <laughs> so. I guess you'll just have to see. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yes, so so I can gain it up and down like this, which is incredibly helpful because I can now just by holding shift or using the scroll wheel or and and placing the the mouse pointer at different points um, work very quickly um, and. This does take some time in order to get used to it. Uh, and what will happen if you if you kind of try to, I think, think there might be a setting to turn this thing on or off. Um, 
Pursue the notes of the other students. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, what will happen in the beginning is you're gonna you're gonna select these uh, these things, and because you're gonna move them, and then you want to scroll up in in the project, like you want to do this. Uh, but you have your mouse pointer over these regions and you end up uh, raising or lowering the gain instead. So that is going to happen uh, in the beginning. I'm just, I'm just kind of letting you know, but uh, once you get this stuff under your fingers, it's a, it's a great way to work. So I, I uh, recommend, recommend it. <clears throat> Let me see, that was a vocal editing, not at all, it was not. We have done fades. Uh, however, if we kind of continue to think about uh, these guys being vocal tracks, uh, me doing stuff like this, like looking through, moving, moving past, and kind of cleaning up the small things in between tracks, is something that I very, very much uh, spend uh, spend time doing. Uh, and that is going to do a couple of things. It's going to uh, get rid of uh, smacking noises. So those kinds of noises, which everyone hates. Um, it's going to get rid of uh, like people poking the mic, poking the, the mic stand, all sorts of different sounds that you hear. And if there's any noise in the room that you're recording, for example, a, an air condition is, it's, is uh, making all sorts of low frequency noises. And if you are recording in the same way that me and my wife were uh, when we recorded this, uh, that you're recording with the same mic through the same equipment in the same room, then those problem frequencies, for example, from uh, the computer uh, uh, making computer noises uh, is going to be amplified as many times. So there's maybe 20, 25 tracks here. So those sounds would be 25 times louder every 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 time there's a break in the singing. Uh, and so it's very important to get rid of these things, especially when the recording is not uh, in a perfect room, which uh, to be honest, it probably never is. <laughs> so um, very important stuff to do. Um, and I get rid of a lot of different things. Uh, I'm, and I can, I can also save some uh, or fix some problems by doing it this way, because it's a lot easier to, for example, replace a, um, a breath that sounds very strange with another breath uh, that's very easy to do like if this if this was a breath right here i could say yeah i want to replace that with that uh, breath and that would work fine and i would select everything and, ooh, and hit x and now all of these have small he said okay Yes, it does. It's just very, very, very tiny. So if I zoom in even more, maybe they're not, they're not showing. I know that there's a fade there because when I try to hit X once more, it has uh, th that window pops up, but okay. <clears throat> you can do, if you go to audio and open um, cross, where's the uh, just fade strange open fade editors maybe it's not here project auto fade settings so you can actually incubate setup uh, that is automatically going to fade 10 milliseconds um, if you want to and that way you're kind of getting a little help. Like you can see here, there's fades here now. So uh, now you know, and you can, yep, do all sorts of stuff. So that's good, good to know. Um, okay, uh, we have a quick, quick and dirty mix of a vocal. Let's do a quick and dirty mix of a vocal.
And I do this to kind of show um, what I, what you guys can expect of yourselves after working with this stuff for a while. And I say a while, and I mean a while, not because I'm some sort of genius, because, but because I've been doing it for a long time. So, um, this is, this is not my preferred setup at all. So I'm just gonna kind of have a listen to this. So this is me singing in, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> Start off. like you to be classics and spaced space echo Question, is it possible to use the low frequency noises from air conditions, uh, etc., as a comparator sample to remove the matching tones from other, the other recordings from that same space? Yes, uh, that is the way um, RX works, for example. So if we open up RX spectral denoise, um, then you would be able to find a, a spot that is silent and, and click learn and then it would create like a profile of that air conditioned noise and be able to remove that from from the original recording and other recordings. Um, however, this is frequencies that you're getting rid of. So you will also remove stuff f uh, like you're removing valuable information most often. Um, so there's always a, um, a trade-off. Um, and that's also why you can experiment with how much you would turn down the volume if you're using these tools. These are tools that are third party. Um, so <clears throat> uh, just be aware of that. Uh, but that kind of answers the question. Uh, so, so with a lot of noise reduction software, uh, then you can uh, create profiles based on um, like a noise profile. And so if I'm doing uh, work that are very specific, um, specifically needs to have low noise, then I will very often record like um, 20 seconds, 30 seconds without anyone in the room, just so that I have it in case and just call it like a, a noise profile and, and put it off at the end of the project which is very helpful, has uh, helped me out uh, lots of times. Uh, let me see, just get rid of you and boom. 
<clears throat> okay, so uh, what I've did, uh, what I've done is just added an EQ and a compressor, and we're going to talk about these, uh, what these things are very soon, and uh, that's good. I also added some uh, effects, uh, a reverb and a delay, and we we added those as effects tracks, and we're going to talk about the difference between uh, adding a reverb right here and and sending it to another bus so all of that is coming up um, and we are now done with module number three of five so that is that's good and the the module number four is going to be all about these tools that you've seen me use a little bit uh, here and then here and there and uh, we're going to be using this track for the most part I think to uh, to learn about it so let me get rid of you and kind of get back to the starting point here something 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 dark side there we go and then just do this and um, now it looks very clean. Good. I'm closing you down and let's have a look at. Just get rid of you, get rid of you. And we have you and only you. So Z uh, actually uh, makes the track really big. Just so you guys know. So I'm just going to test out the volume before we start. And we're going to start with the equalizer and start to uh, explain what that is. Okay, so this is another uh, one of my tracks, which are more done. It's it's like mixed mixed enough for the job. <clears throat> okay, um, and we're going to add in. We we could add like if uh, the the um, EQ that follows. Uh, it comes comes with Cubase. It's called Frequency, and it's a very very nice EQ. Uh, and uh, um, I encourage you to use it. Um, I think I am going to. <sighs> yes, I'm going to use what I'm used to. Uh, but just know that there's nothing in what I'm going to show you now that this uh, EQ can't do, or maybe a couple of things, but not. Not too many things. It's mainly a workflow thing. So Pro Q3. What I also can do with this guy is to maximize it. Yes, uh, which is cool. Um, but I'm, I'm, I don't need to maximize it. <laughs> but I can make this very large instead and do this so that uh, I'm not I'm not in the way of anything uh, with my face okay so let's just listen a little bit so we know that what that we're working with uh, again was a video about uh, a clock brand which is why there's so many clock sounds there um, okay so this is a, a an EQ and as I've been playing you've probably seen a lot of different frequencies uh, and I've drawn a couple of these already these frequency uh, charts and we've seen like the the microphone charts um, kind of look like this so you have uh, a starting frequency of 20 down here and at the end it's it says 20k which marks the spectrum that of human hearing right if I add let me see if we can add this um, yes 
Yes, we need to do some theory now. Oh, yes. Uh, we need we need to do signal generator. Test generator. Yes, thank you. So, <clears throat> how great, how great. So, sound. Sound, what is sound? And what's the definition of sound? I've already said it, but um, again, sound is, I'm just translating it to English. Um, air set in motion would be my <laughs> direct translation. <laughs> um, so what happens when, you, when you're hearing stuff is that air hits your eardrums they they vibrate and through all sorts of different things that I, I readily admit I don't know nothing about <laughs> um, it gets turned into signals that the the brain can read and I think that's amazing because it happens so quickly um, so quickly that we can kind of make sense of it, uh, make sense of it all, and speak to each other, and uh, listen to music, and it's pretty awesome when you have a think about it. <clears throat> but that's the definition of sound, and that's exactly what a, a speaker does as well. It has a, a speaker element that moves back backwards and forwards, and kind of pushes air. Um, and so we, we're talking about the range of human hearing as somewhere between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. And hertz means times per second, per second, and is not only used for sound, but is also used for different kinds of signals, radio signals, or a CPU, like a processor, or speed. Um, but it means times per second. And in sound, in the sound world, it means uh, number of sound waves, like um, per second. <clears throat> okay, so twenty to twenty thousand uh, is that correct? That we can hear those frequencies. Well, first of all. Um, the the older you get, the 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 less of the upper frequency you're going to be able to hear at all. It's just the nature of our ears. So it is all going downhill from now on. <laughs> and uh, my students are from between ten and fifteen years older than me, uh, or, or <laughs> younger than me. I mean, um, and so they already uh, when we do tests in the classroom. They already uh, can hear more than I can, um, and it's it's great to know that it will only get worse. No, we'll still be able to to enjoy sound for for uh, decades to come. But I often describe the the uh, up uh, the upper part and the lower part of the frequency spectrum that we can hear more of like a, a uh, feeling than an, an actual uh, that, that I'm actually hearing frequencies. What do I mean by that? Um, as I approach the upper spectrum of what I can hear, I'm feeling uncomfortable, but I'm not always able to say that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing something with my ears, but I, I, I feel uncomfortable. And if we talk about the lower end of the spectrum, um, you've probably uh, like felt if you've been to a, a live concert with a large P PA um, that you can feel the air uh, physically in your chest or you could feel your trousers uh, kind of flapping um, from the base. And so that is that is makes sense once we now know that sound is air set in motion. So you're, you're feeling the, the wind from the speakers. Um, but I can't really say that I'm hearing those frequencies. I'm, I'm not sure if you guys will agree or disagree, but that's 
kind of my stance on on the matter. Uh, and some will will very very especially on YouTube will be very adamant about how how clearly they hear nineteen and a half k and and how much better their ears are than everyone else's. And I just I don't uh, believe them. <laughs> but okay, <laughs> we can argue about that. Um, for me, at least, it's it's more of a of, of a, a feeling than a an actual sound in the ranges. So there's a couple of things we need to talk about when it comes to this. So first of all, let's let's uh, put the EQ after the test generator so that we can actually have a look at it. So now we can see what we're uh, working with, which is cool. Let me do this. And off we go. So I'm turning this on. And what we're hearing right now is the sine wave. A sine wave is the purest form of uh, a sound that we can hear. And what's special about it is that it has only one frequency when it plays. Um, everything that we hear from, a, from a, an acoustic instrument is going to have multiple frequencies and it's the weighting of those different frequencies overtones we call them that's going to determine the the timbre timbre is a word that's hard to pronounce in english but t-i-m-b-r-e um, and i am realizing that i'm not showing you this um but i, I I'll, I'll show you show you it soon so let's say um what makes the sound sound like a guitar or a piano? If the note is the same, uh, how can we tell uh, what instrument it is? Well, it's because of the overtones. And uh, I, I would love to be able to show you the difference uh, with a couple of examples, but we're not going to do that today. Um, but just know that that is uh, how instruments sound different. However, a sine wave, not, no, I'm right here. Um, a sine wave has only one frequency. As we can see right here. And if I change this frequency to uh, a thousand, you can see that it's the same uh, all over. Let's change it to like 250. Okay, it, it looks like it's getting wider, but it really isn't. It's just the way that the, the this graph is weighted. So <clears throat> there you know. Um, what happens if I change this sine wave to a triangle wave? Well, now it looks like that, which is completely different because it has a lot of overtones in it now. And you can hear that it sounds different as well compared to the sine wave. You can hear that the note is the same, but the kind of timbre of it is very much different. And you can kind of hear maybe the um, uh, the the octave of it in there, and maybe a fifth above that if if you're familiar with music theory. Um, and there is a um, there there is a way of that, that that stacking and those intervals between the different overtones and that is not changing between different instruments as much um, however the volume of each overtone one after the other uh, is is what affects the the sound of <laughs> of that note and makes it sound like a guitar or a piano or and so on and if i if i add in a square wave Oh, you can see that there's even more overtones. And you also have a sawtooth wave here, which is uh, doesn't have as many uh, overtones.
right, okay. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about these two as well, a white noise and a pink noise. So white noise looks like, uh, sounds like this, and I'm just going to turn it down a little bit. Or I could do it here as well. So this is white noise. And it's the sound that you've hear, heard uh, on your TV if there's no channels um, running or if on your radio, if, if there's no uh, radio station, right? It's just white noise, it's just noise. So now what's the different, difference between white noise and pink noise? Let's hear. If, if you were to describe that, it would probably be that the white noise sounds a lot brighter uh, and the pink noise maybe has a little bit more bass uh, and also it sounds more comfortable. Um, now, the brownian I'm not too familiar with. Let's have a listen. Ooh. Interesting. So, <clears throat> difference is in brownian might be a, another uh, that's even more correct corrected, but white noise is the scientific uh, way of playing back all fre frequencies at the same time. So, all frequencies from twenty hertz to twenty k is is being played back at the same volume um, scientifically which means like with a measuring microphone, it will be flat, right? However, it doesn't sound flat to our ears because we're not hearing uh, linearly. Um, and I, I try to use like a picture of uh, for a long, long time ago in Africa, your family is uh, in the other side of a, the savanna, and you have 20 elephants running towards them. But you're still able to uh, pick out their voices. Maybe. <laughs> I haven't tested it. <laughs> Although you're still here, uh, even though you're probably hearing more of the rumbling from the feet of the elephants. Uh, and I think that's why we maybe um, don't hear as much. Our, our ears aren't as sensitive um, to bass frequencies as we are for the, the range where the human voice lies. And... Uh, that's one example of why that might be important. <laughs> okay, so pink noise is more uh, catered towards what we're actually hearing. Uh, and Brownian might be like if I look at the frequency chart here, the frequency analyzer in the Pro Q3, it, that looks the most flat to me, right? So that's always how I've learned things that pink noise is uh, adjusted, but uh, Brownian might be even even more adjusted toward, towards our hearing. Uh, so that's just a little tidbit there. Um, I want to I want to show you one more thing. So if we go back to a sine wave like this, I need to tell you one more thing, which is very important. Um, this plugin started at 440 hertz that is not um that's a very special number in music because 440 hertz is the note a and is used for tuning orchestras at least in this part of europe uh, there's some small differences depending on where you live uh, but around here And we haven't talked about that at all yet. 
we've talked about frequencies and and hearing and and often when we start to talk about this EQ stuff and and kind of shaping sounds, we're talking about terms like if something is muddy, something is uh, sharp or edgy or cuts through, if something is crisp or bassy, like th these are um, ways to express what we're hearing, but it has nothing with tonality um, to do. <laughs> but frequencies can also be used for that, uh, which is very interesting. So I'll show you one thing, 440 hertz. If I cut this in half and say 220 hertz, I'm now down an octave. And same if I go up two octaves now though. This is very interesting because if I have a problem frequency at 75, the uh, the, the possibility of me having problems at 150 hertz, which would be the octave for that, right, is very big. And the reason for that, if we have a look back at this setup here, the reason for that is probably, like if I have one sine wave here, um, and I'm gonna say that this is one, one cycle, Right, so if I now have a a sound wave that kind of moves at, at the ha uh, um, half of the speed, you'll see that some of these, uh, like every other um, uh, every other cycle of the original of this guy, will still be at the same point every other time, right? So <clears throat> even though they're not the same frequencies, they kind of work together with the uh, speaker element going back and forth. So they resonate together. <clears throat> so I wanted to tell you that uh, and show that there's a duality when we're talking about frequency. We can talk about the tonal side of frequencies and the soundscape kind of way of thinking of it. And we need to think about both. So let's talk about some very simple things. Uh, in This is an EQ again, and this is a visual representation of that EQ. And so I can very, very easily add stuff in here. So this is, I've now added a high cut filter or a low pass filter. It's the same thing, it's just different way, different way, different ways of looking at it. So I could either look at it um, in a way that I'm cutting away the high frequencies, or I can look at it like I'm leaving the uh, lower frequencies, okay? So, sounds like this. probably heard that in a lot of uh, electronic music and before the drop hits and all of that malarkey. Okay, um, uh, the we can do the exact opposite here and uh, saying that we're going to keep the high frequencies uh, so the, the uh, low cut of the higher pass, right? And that sounds like this. Ooh. Sorry of from those noises, I'm not sure. Cubase is feeling a little sick today. <clears throat> but you get my point. So that is uh, cutting everything below a certain point or, uh, yeah, or everything above a certain point. We can also talk about shelves. This is a shelf. 
And what's special about a shelf? Well, it, it goes up, but it doesn't come down. Or if you, if you take it the other way, it goes down, but it doesn't come up again. And you can do that for the other side of things as well. And that's a shelf, a low shelf or a high shelf. And then the most common thing is the bell, which goes up to a certain point and then goes down again. What's special about what's special about newer type of EQs like this one is uh, that the, the different bands that you can add in are parametric, and what that means is that I'm able to adjust the slope of the uh, of the band itself, which is very helpful, uh, and you can kind of hear you can kind of see visually what that does. Sorry if I exaggerate it. Like it's it's gonna affect a larger or a smaller area. Mm, helpful? Yes, very helpful. I'm gonna show you I'm gonna show you the technique that I teach the students for, for learning EQ and, and working with an EQ, that is the technique that I use every day. Um, I've recently started seeing some videos about people not, in, not liking this way of working and I can see their arguments. However, <clears throat> I firmly believe that working uh, when when learning this kind of stuff, it's it's a, the best way. Okay, so I I call this the search and destroy method, and it's very simple. Okay, starting from scratch, I'm just adding a a band here, and that's going to be a little bit different from from every EQ. We can have a look at it in frequency afterwards, um, but I'm I'm adding a band, and then I'm Moving the Q factor, which you can see down here with a Q, to be very small, not too small because then it's going to be too hard to hear, but somewhere and just play around with it a little bit and, and move it up a lot in volume, all right? So if we're here, And then you're just gonna move it up and down and try to find uh, find things that you don't like. Frequencies that kind of are singing and ringing and making you uncomfortable. Okay, so for me that was definitely this place right here. And with this EQ I can even solo that band. So that was a frequency for me where I, I didn't like that. And then I'm going to turn that down and then continue on. So that can look something like this if you, if you do it. Um, yes. Something like that. And sometimes, sometimes I can just solo it instead of listening in the full mix. Something like that. And now I turned all of these off and on with one uh, with with one button. <clears throat> so that is the search and destroy technique. It's not advanced at all, and it just um, enables you to. Um, amplify what you're listening for, which is a very important concept when you're trying to learn uh, how things sound. Uh, what you, what you're, uh, you're you're training your ear to uh, um, towards listening to the right thing. And one thing, one thing that's very common when working with sound is that your mind 
will play tricks on you. Especially when you've gotten a little bit further and you kind of know what the different tools at your disposal does. Maybe you've invested in a very cool piece of gear and you would really like it to work for everything. And so your mind will play tricks on you. And it's important to be aware of uh, because it happens all the time. <laughs> One example is uh, that I often do some stuff with an EQ uh, back and forth and uh, I can like feel like this is really making a difference. And suddenly I realize that I'm uh, using an EQ on the wrong track. Happens all the time. So just be aware of it um, and don't be afraid of kind of... Mm, exaggerating the effect that you would like to tune your ears towards and then back off because you're still going to your ears are still going to be tuned towards that thing to listen for um, let me see if I can show this uh, so if we go to the the mix that we're going to work on afterwards <laughs> Okay, for example, here in this transition, there's a low swell here. And I don't hear it that well in the mix. So I'm going to just listen to it in solo to kind of figure out what 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 that sound is. Because I can see that there's a lot of sound. So let's just have a listen. Okay. And now, if I play this back, I believe you guys will be able to hear that sound a lot better. So let's see. That's at least uh, the way it works for me. So so I can listen to a dense mix um, that has a lot of different tracks and not not hear a, a one, one part of it at all. And then I just listen to it in solo for 10 seconds. And when I listen back to the full mix, suddenly I can hear that without a problem. So the, the ability to tune your ears towards something uh, is, I don't think it's, I, I just think it's possible for everyone. I don't think it's something you need to train to get better at. Um, but that is some of that, some of the power that we wield when we mix something and when we produce something, we are able to guide the listener through uh, the journey of the song or the uh, I don't know film score or the TV episode or whatever it is that you're mixing you're able to guide the listener and that is a big big task and a very important task and a very creative task uh, and a lot of people don't think mixing is very creative I beg to differ okay um, yes, we will move on and talk about a compressor. Let me see, I was still going to use this. Yes, let's use this. So. Cool, I'm gonna add in, again, I'm gonna use uh, Pro-Q's compressor. I just find them a little bit better visually when I'm teaching. No particular reason why I couldn't use uh, the, the compressor in um, Cubase, <clears throat> except that this is a little bit more visual. Okay, what is a compressor? I call the compressor the, the magical finger. And the reason why I call it that is because um, having done a lot of live audio, I got used to always having uh, a hand on the lead vocal 
fader and I would kind of work with the phrases of the lead vocal uh, turning the volume up a little bit at the end of the phrases or maybe if I knew that a a strong note was was going to come in the melody then I would turn the fader down a little bit and kind of work dynamically with uh, the performance. <clears throat> this is also something we do in mixing in uh, by automating the volume of the different tracks um, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about it in this course. Um, however, for, for live stuff, it was a, a big part of kind of pushing um, everything out of, uh, that I, I could out of the faders and, and the, the live mix. <clears throat> so I think it's a, it's a great way to learn to do this kind of stuff, uh, to do some live audio as well. Uh, I like best to be in the studio, but, but the whole thought of only having one uh, shot at things uh, is, is something that really appeals to some people. Uh, so, um, yes, if that is you, go and do live audio sound and have a great time. I love having uh, multiple tries. <laughs> and so I ended up in the studio instead. All right. So a compressor. We're going to talk about a threshold. Oh, maybe we should just use these. A, a ratio, an attack, and a release, and a gain. And maybe we'll talk about the knee as well. And that is all we're going to talk about. And <clears throat> these are going to be new concepts. However, once we've learned these, uh, we automatically know a couple of other dynamic plugins as well. Uh, I said dynamic plugin. What do I mean by that? So when, when we've been working with an EQ earlier, we set some settings and those settings were static. Uh, there, there would be, the, those settings would be the same no matter what, uh, depending on, it wouldn't matter if there was no sound at all or was, if there was a blazingly loud uh, sound on that track, the settings would still be the same. Uh, however, a compressor is a dynamic plugin and it reacts differently based on the sound that, that goes into the plugin. And uh, we're going to learn about that. So <clears throat> let's have a look at the threshold, first of all, and let's see what um, what the Pro-C2 says itself. It says the threshold knob determines above which side chain, uh, above which side chain level the gain should be reduced. Uh, I think that is a little bit hard to understand, maybe. So if I turn this up and down, you can see this, this uh, line go up and down. And if I play, if I put the threshold all the way to the top, here I can see the sound, right? Beautiful. Um, so far, so good. So if I put the threshold further down, then more of the sound is gonna go over the threshold. And what happens when we get above the threshold is determined by these other buttons. But this is how we set that threshold. So just just showing you what it looks like um, right now. Obviously, we're kind of breaking the rules here because we're going over zero dB, and that is because of this, guys. Let me just fix that. There we go. So you can see kind of a graph of what is happening. So the red line in this case will be uh, what is the compressor doing or not doing. So if, if the line is just flat on top, then it's not doing anything at all. When it moves down, it actually turns down the volume. <clears throat> and the threshold 
decides at what point should uh, the, the compressor start to turn down the audio. And uh, so let's see if we can make a proper example of this. If we set the threshold to minus 20, which is right here, and if we thought to ourselves that this audio clip uh, went 10 decibel over that threshold, then uh, the ratio would decide how much those 10 decibels would be turned down in volume. And that is very simply just a ratio of four to one. So, so like from math classes, when you're working with uh, maps or if you're working with model models, like a, a model that's uh, to, uh, one to 100, uh, it's just a ratio number. And so uh, it says um, here, the ratio knob sets the proportional compression amount for signals above the threshold. For example, a ratio of five to one means that only one decibel of output gain is left for every five decibel of input gain above the threshold. That is a very good explanation. So I, would, I was gonna say if, if we set it to five, five to one, and we go 10 decibel over the threshold, then that would be reduced to two decibels over the threshold. And similarly, if I have a ratio of two to one with the same example, I go 10 decibel over the threshold, and that's gonna turn down the volume to reduce it to five decibels over the threshold. Um, so it's gonna look like this. And the same part, if I have it set to five to one, it sounds a lot more um, strict, which it is. Five to one is a lot more than two to one. <clears throat> okay, uh, attack. Let's see what uh, ProQ2 has to say. The attack knob determines how quickly compression will kick in, ranging from a very small amount of time uh, to 250 milliseconds. Note, because of its program dependence and very custom attack and release curves, the shown times are approximate, much like an analog gear. Keep this in mind when comparing different compressor styles of compressors. It doesn't make much sense to just dial in the same settings. It's better to try and match certain time settings by ear. Okay. <clears throat> So if the sound crosses the threshold, you can uh, tell the compressor how fast or slow it's gonna start to act by, by moving the attack knob. And similarly with the release knob, you can do, uh, okay, uh, let's just read it. The release knob sets the time that the compressor takes to recover from gain reduction. The various compressor characteristics is different release models, and in most cases, the release time is very program dependent. Okay, yeah. yes. <clears throat> so the release works oppositely. Um, so after the sound uh, goes under the threshold, how long before the compressor stops uh, working? Beautiful. So. Um, with the compressor, we've now started with a difference in dynamics that maybe was here, I don't know, maybe here. And what we've done up until this point has been to turn down the loudest parts, right? That's what we've done. Started here and turned down the loudest parts. What most people say that a compressor does is that it raises the lower parts, like not most people, but I often hear it and it's wrong because what you you actually do is you, you turn down the loudest parts. And now to be able to make a proper comparison between what we started with and what we are listening to now, we need to raise the volume so that the volume is approximately at the same listening level, okay? So we started here, turned down everything, and now we're raising it up. And we're doing that with 
this button in this case, wet gain. So the, the um, makeup gain. If I just add a compressor, uh, Steinberg compressor, you can see it here. Here it's called makeup, makeup gain. And for uh, please, when trying to learn this, turn off this button that says auto makeup gain because uh, I think it's better when you're learning to try to do this uh, on your own, okay? Ah, because uh, if, if the plugins are doing stuff that we don't understand when we don't understand the tool yet, that is not a good way to go. Okay. That is basically what a compressor does. Uh, we can have a listen to what it sounds like if we overuse this. Now you can kind of see from the from the red line that it's never stopping compressing. It's compressing all the time, maybe even in the beginning. And so it's this this the result of the sound is that it's going to sound squashed and kind of muffled, or it sounds like the sound can't breathe because we're crushing the dynamics so that the difference between the loudest and the, the softest parts are almost nothing. So all dynamics are gone, which is not a cool place to be. So you can kind of see here now that because when, when, the, when the sound gets lower in volume, the compressor stops turning it down, it, 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 the result is that the softer parts of the signal is is turned up in volume, but that's only because I've turned the volume up here at the uh, at the output gain, right? That enables me to ha to listen a little bit on the before and after. And, and try to listen only for the effect of the compressor and not listen for the volume change. Because what happens when we hear one uh, signal compared to another signal and one of them is louder than the other is that we're gonna hear more bass and more uh, uh, high frequencies from the louder signal, right? And we like that. And so often we will um, we would choose the signal that has is louder um, just because of that. Because we like the bass and we like the high frequencies. Mm. And we can talk about a lot of stuff when we're talking about that world. Like, do you have a set listening volume when you're mixing and when you're producing that you, that you can always return to? Like I have, uh, Cubase has this, it's called a reference level. And I've set mine to minus six dB just because that's the way I've set up my gear. Um, but uh, if sometimes I would, I will, I'll listen at a lower volume. And you guys want, uh, I, I don't believe, yeah, I don't believe you guys will hear any difference, but here I'm, I'm turning my volume down and very easily I can get back to minus six dB. Uh, and that's where I uh, usually uh, am. And I'll actually show you, show it to you uh, as well. This is what I meant. So in the control room, there is a button here called the reference level, and I can turn that up or down. Very, very, very helpful. Uh, before the control room in Cubase, I used uh, like a volume knob and I, I, I uh, had a piece of tape, uh, both on the knob and on the chassis. And so they were supposed to be at the same uh, location. Uh, and that was my listening spot. And that's, that also works <clears throat> definitely, but this is a lot easier. <laughs> so there you go. That is a compressor. And we talked about the parameters of the compressor and very quickly, I'll, I'll just go through a couple of different things. So um, 
uh, pro G again this is a gate uh, which works a little differently but still has a lot of the same knobs so we have a threshold knob a ratio knob and a range knob in this case but we also have the, in, an attack and a release okay so so we can say we can say that it's threshold but it works kind of the opposite way. So instead of saying uh, when when the sound goes over this th threshold, something's gonna happen, we're saying when the sound goes under this threshold, something's gonna happen. And <clears throat> in, in the case of a gate, we are turning the volume down by uh, how much, how however much the range is. So uh, I think I've set it up so that we're hearing very little of that uh, beginning thing. Okay, so if I turn it just a little higher, I should be able to not hear anything. Okay, a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that is the gate, and we can set the attack and the release, and, and, and those are pretty similar to what we've already learned. So when do you use a gate? Well, um, there's a couple of examples. Uh, if you would like to separate one source from another source uh, and you have multiple mics um, micing the same source. So for example, when you're doing a drum set and you want to kind of separate the snare sound and, and get rid of the, 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 the sound in the snare mic from the other instruments. So you get rid of the cymbals as much as you can and get rid of the kick sound in the snare mic then you can use a gate uh, also uh, if you're doing uh, like a podcast thingy and there is a noisy signal you can use a gate to kind of set a threshold so that it will turn down the volume when no one's speaking which can also be very very nice uh, and helpful and so this little thing can can help you not having to go through every like if it's two hours of voiceover um, this can help you out a lot right and save you a lot of time it's not perfect right it's just another tool in the toolbox but that's a gate uh, let's turn off because it's it's not a good use to use it for that, this exact thing um, but we have uh, we have other things to talk about Let's talk about the Pro DS. This is a DSer, and again, I'm showing you third-party stuff. Don't, don't uh, think too much about this. Uh, think about the concepts and the theory behind the tools. So, a DSer uh, traditionally gets rid of S's in vocals, right? So what happens if you have a vocal and you've compressed it? So you've turned down the loudest parts and you've raised the volume. So you're raising the, the, the more softer parts. Can you think of a super, super, super loud screaming S? Probably not. Because the difference between a super quiet s and a super loud s is not that much in volume and so what happens when you turn down all the other things and raise all, all of the uh, softer sounds is you often get some problems with s's in a lead vocal and this is very common with all of all of the different um tools that we're learning about and using that we're, we might be solving one problem but we might also be creating a new one further down the road and that's also why i've been talking about the noises that you you are recording from from the air condition or or uh, like some noise that shouldn't be there or some malfunctioning equipment because again, when we're compressing and raising the volume, we're also raising the volume of those things. 
So in order to not raise the volume of those things so much, but uh, like, I mean, to reduce the, the noise of, uh, of the noise um, originally, it's, that's important. <laughs> that was my point, <laughs> sorry. Okay, um, so a de -esser. Let's have a look at a de -esser. Here we have a de and it's very, very simple. Very simple. We have a threshold, as usual. We have a range, just like with the gate, uh, but it's not, it's not set to minus 50, it's set to minus six. What happens if we if you turn down the S's way too much is that if if that's the time like this when you when it's big, um, and so there's no there's no S's uh, left. So the thing that's different is I'm able to audition the frequency range that I'm I'm tuning this deesser towards um, because in effect this deesser is a compressor that works within a given frequency range. So it doesn't work on the whole frequency spectrum, but it works within a range. And that range could be uh, la like bigger with a wide band, or it could be a split band, like a, a smaller band, depending on the deesser, all right? But I can, now I'm auditioning this, this thing and I can make this range bigger, or smaller, and move it. All right, so let's have a listen. So I hope it goes without saying that you can use this for things that aren't S's, right? You can use it for uh, whatever. So right here, I found that frequency a little offensive. <laughs> so what if I wanted to kind of try to control it a little bit? And this is also a dynamic plugin. It's not uh, a, a static plugin. So I'm not always turning down these frequencies like I would if I were using an EQ. But I'm, I'm, um, I'm saying dynamically speaking, if the sound goes over a threshold, then turn it down within that frequency range. So. right now it happens so quickly that it doesn't even show up but um, that is uh, yes hello hello mr. jazz uh, so this um, so within that frequency range you can use it for whatever I like to classify a de -er like a multi-band compressor with only one band. And you might ask, what is a multi-band compressor? And I will show you. Let me see. Uh, uh, do we have a multi-band compressor? Yes, we do. So this is Cubase's own. Let's have a look at it. This is in effect four different compressors uh, that had, each has a different job. The blue one is working on the low end and the gray one is working on the high end. And then we have two guys in the middle that takes care of different frequencies. And so if I would bypass number one, two, and four, I would in effect have a de -er, right? Because I have a compressor that works with within a frequency range do the exact same thing here and solo it. Set a threshold. With a ratio. We have a um, multiband compressor. No, we have a de -esser. 
and a multiband compressor is just the same times whatever many. And you don't need to use all of them. You can use one for the low end and one for the nasty frequencies that we just got rid of um, and listen to each one individually. And you can do a sort of, if, if, if this is very new for you, uh, I would not advise starting with a multiband compressor because it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that, hmm, I have four bands. I need to use all four. When uh, often you, you don't need. <laughs> so um, just keep that in mind. Uh, very often you can get away with using a compressor or a de -esser. right? Cool, we've been through a lot of different things and we're now gonna to start to look into uh, sends, group tracks, reverb, and the differences between inserts and sends. Cool. The only thing I'm thinking about is, is if I'm going to go uh, to the bathroom before or after next session. We're uh, going to push on. Mm. Okay, five and a half hours. <clears throat> this is good. This is good. Let's talk about reverb. Reverb, what is reverb? Well, it's a artificial way to um, make something sound like it's in a different space. Okay, so we've all heard reverb. Um, reverb is a natural part of our lives. Um, I was uh, asking the students um, not too long ago, how, how are you able to determine if you were, if you were blindfolded? Um, how would you determine if the room you were in was a large room or a small room and why uh, would you be able to hear that? And so they told me that, well, it's because uh, you would hear the, the length of the sound in the room uh, and that is because you're hearing the reflections from the walls and that's of course correct. Uh, so you're hearing, and uh, that—that's also why you're hearing an echo when you're screaming in the in the mountains. If if that's you, um, and so we have uh, when we're doing reverbs, <laughs> which way to start? Um, so let's try to add. I've already added some reverbs, so let's add them in here. So I have one example of a reverb this guy. Great. And I'll add in another effects track, which I can do again by right clicking here, clicking the effect track. And here I can select the plugin. Let's see if we can find, let's do, uh, what's the IR? Uh, let's sort by vendor uh, again, and we'll try to use, um, try to use Steinberg's reverb and I I think the room works is the convolution one and convolution Mr. Peter hello as always thank you for sharing your time with us much appreciated thank you thank you I'm, I'm having a blast it's just a it's just a lot left <laughs> I'm going five and a half hours already. So we'll see, we'll see, but I'm, I'm gonna, I'm confident. Um, so this is the reverb series. Okay, so this looks like it's not a uh, convolution reverb. So let's change it, which you can do after you've created it, by the way. Uh, by going to the insert and instead of using that one, maybe using a revelation. That is 
what I was looking for. <clears throat> okay. Ah. Okay. These reverbs are different. Okay, in what way? So one of these are being created by the computer uh, in its entirety. Let's let's make this easier, and let's not use that reverb, but let's use a Valhalla vintage verb instead. Okay. These can go up to seventy seconds of reverb, and it sounds like this. Uh, which, which ones? Let's do you and do the reverb and the con convolution. It's probably not going to sound that different, but a 70 second reverb is going to sound for 70 seconds. So it's, it's, it's still going, still going, still going. And now I'm turning it off. Okay. <clears throat> So this is being created by an algorithm in the computer, while this revelation reverb is being created with uh, from from an actual room. So they've gone into an actual room and played uh, a burst of noise, recorded it, preferably in the other end of the room from the speaker, right? <clears throat> And then, in, in post-processing, they've gotten rid of the initial sound and kind of gotten a sound profile of that room from when the, the sound started bouncing in the walls until it was silent. And the big difference is I, I'm not able to make that sound any longer than it actually was. I, I can make it shorter, but I can't make it longer than it was. Right? So where's the with the place? I can ER tail. No, where's the time? I'm looking for a time. Z, z tail. Main time. 50%, 100%. It's probably here. Yes. So, so if I'm not using that, but I'm using the convolution reverb. Yes, and I, I'm not hearing it because, there we go. So let's find, is this guy also doing something crazy? I might, I might be mistaken. Is even the, con like the reverence, revelation, not in uh, a convolution reverb? I see that there is some modulation going, so it might be the case. Reverence then. This. This is the correct one. <laughs> and so you can even, uh, even with this plugin, you can artificially lengthen it, but you can kind of see it in percent. So, so this is a shorter room, obviously. But if I browse it and say a concert hall, it's going to be longer, right? And if I center these, right, it's now easier to hear, hopefully. So there we go. <clears throat> That's the two main uh, different reverbs and ash. Okay, what is the simplest way of explaining a compressor and convolution reverb plus general reverb? I need to recap on this. Uh, I just went through a compressor. Um, so it, it's, it's gonna be, um, uh, I'll leave this video up. So I'm not gonna repeat it right now. Um, but a convolution reverb, uh, like I, I mentioned, is a, an actual uh, recording of a room. So traditionally, you can't extend the length of that reverb longer than the recording of that room actually actually is. If there's if there's a room that it, that has a reverb time of two seconds, you can't add to that. But with an algorithmic reverb, 
you can go mad and do things like we just saw on the um, uh, is Cubase just crashing now? Hello? No? There we go. Uh, with the Valhalla reverb, you can add this up to 70 seconds of, of reverb. <clears throat> so that's the main difference. They might sound a little different. Just have, have a go listening to them. Make up your mind uh, of, of how you how you like each one. It's also a very real possibility of, um, of using both. Like um, um, doing a little bit of a convolution reverb and a little bit of the uh, of an algorithmic reverb, um, and and by 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 that ending up with a sort of a mix between the two. Okay, <laughs> what I've done here is I've added these as effects FX channels. Now. Cubase makes this a little bit easier to understand, I think, than Pro Tools, which is where I usually train this course uh, at university. So, so I think this is going to make a lot more sense than it does in Pro Tools, um, but it might not. So let's have a look. Up until now, we've added uh, tools as inserts on each individual track. So for this vocal, we've added an EQ, right? We've added an EQ and a compressor to that track in, it, in, uh, in itself. What does that mean? Well, this comes from uh, like traditional, traditionally talking about um, how mixers were built like analog mixers, I would argue. So if we have a look, this is a mixing desk and it was built or and is still built in this way. So you have channel strips and you say that the XLR will enter right here at the back, for example. So and you will have certain different components that the uh, electrical signal from the XLR will go through, like things we've talked about already. Like for example, we have uh, the gain, where we amplify the signal through the, the preamp. So we're gaining the signal up, all right? It might pass through, um, an EQ which we have also talked about, right? And some uh, mixers, especially a little bit more expensive ones, will continue to go through and have a compressor, right? Very nice. Um, after that, on typical compressors, you would have something called sends or Oxes. And at the end, you would have your trusty fader. Beautiful. My drawing skills are amazing. Right. The important thing to, to, to take away from this picture is that this is the actual signal flow of things. So that, um, uh, after the gain, the signal will go physically through components into the EQ. And after that, it will go physically through components in the compressor. And the product of the compressor will then maybe be sent out to other places. And so sends, sends, send audio. to somewhere. Okay, so far so good. So maybe we're sending, uh, let's just, uh, the, the, the output is usually at the back again. So we're sending to somewhere and that might be a reverb channel. 
Okay. Um, that reverb channel now has some of the signal from this from this chain right here. Okay, and this would be a, like a physical box earlier, right? And the output of that would then go back to a new uh, a fader on the on the on the mixer, and this would now be the reverb. Uh, return. So again, return the affected sound. Woohoo! Okay, so far so good. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> My drawing skills are amazing, as you guys uh, well know by now. But let's try to to replicate this and talk about how it looks in Cubase. Because if I open up the channel settings again, I will see the inserts in the same way, and the the order matters. The order matters, right? So the sound will enter at the top here for the EQ. And the sound that um, it, it, the 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 tool, the sound that the tool produces in this case the EQ, will then be sent into the next insert, in this case a compressor. Okay. And if I had more inserts, this would happen. So think of it like a um, a, a pedal board for guitarists where you physically take the sound and put, put it through a, a stomp box. And, and then the output of that will be sent to the next stomp box. And then the order of the stomp boxes really matters. Uh, like, do I put the compressor here or here? And where in the chain will I put the reverb? That is something a guitarist uh, has to think a lot about when building his pedal board. <clears throat> Um, and sense on this right side is different because I'm not, um, I'm, I'm basically taking this, the signal after I've been through all of these inserts and I'm sending it to somewhere else. So it has, uh, it, there's no sound being added to, to this track when I add in uh, the reverb or add more or less reverb there's also some settings here that we can talk about like if I click if I click this button it turns blue and it just says pre slash post fader which is very interesting and and sometimes uh, most of the time you'll want to keep it like this but sometimes you'd like it to be blue and if you need it to be blue you probably know what it is but it if I'm going to try to explain it very simply, the last place, if we have a look again at our drawing, the last place in our chain was the fader right here. Right? So, oh, oh. So, that affects um, how much I'm sending, even though I might have uh, put this knob to something, I put it to eight on the scent it will still be uh, sent more or less depending on the position of the fader so it's a it, again a ratio number there uh, just like with the compressor over the gate or the de-esser that is the most common way for it to work because it's and it's very nice of it to work that way because if I turn down the volume of the vocal, that means I'm also turning down how much I'm sending to the reverb. So the ratio between the dry signal, which is the, the vocal track, and the wet signal, which is only the reverb in this case, uh, is, is being kept. So if I turn down the vocal, the reverb, will also be turned down. 
if I set this to blue, which means pre-fader, it means that connection is not there anymore. That ratio is not there anymore. So if I say minus 13.2, it's gonna be minus 13.2 no matter how low my fader goes, right? Hopefully that was a, a good explanation of the difference between those two. And if that was hard to understand, then just don't think about it, <laughs> okay? Um, so how do I add a, a reverb to a track or a lot of tracks? I have a key command and I'm gonna show you these because these are very, very cool. So I have um, one for uh, effects, one for Okay, cancel. Well, I have one for groups, and I have one for. These are the ones I use the most, but I have some for VCAs as well, which are not important. But let's talk about. Um, and, and a great way to kind of find uh, a key command, if you can't remember the name of it, is just try to assign it to something else and then it's gonna show up here. So mixer add track to selected effects channel. Hey, here we go. I have control alt shift V for VCA, control alt shift G for group and control alt shift X for effects channel. Uh, originally, these, this menu only shows up in the mixer window. Um, however, it still works in, in, in this window. So if I right click here, I can say add groups, group channels, selected channels. But I, I'm usually in this window. So it's awesome for me to be able to mark all, the, all of the vocals and um, add a reverb channel to all of them, okay? So if we delete the channels that we already have, I can do that. So I can show, I can select all of the vocal tracks, uh, use my key command, find a uh, reverb that I would like to use on vocal. So let's do a lexicon hall, for example, and say uh, reverb vocals, good. And say add track. What uh, happened now? Well, if I go in and have a look at one of these, I can see that uh, on this on this individual track, I already had something uh, adjusted on on this send slot. So therefore, uh, the the send is not um, at unity uh, gain, which means that's the the this symbol right here. Um, but for all of the others, they are, uh, it's the, the send is on, but they're, it's, they're not sending anything. So let, let me just make it the same for all of them. And I can select all of them, go into the mixer. And now I'm gonna show you how I can make all of these send at the same time. Again, I'm gonna use the Q link, which is Alt and Shift or Option Shift, and just raise that volume. <laughs> Right, and if I solo all of the vocals now, great. So now we have some reverb, very nice. Uh, and so, what happens uh, if we have a look back at the Back at the uh, drawing, we we've sent the audio uh, through some through some cables <clears throat> um, and added them to a uh, uh, to to a physical reverb box, right? And so the output of that reverb box that has only reverb in it has to return somewhere, and that is what happens with this effects track. So if we have a look at that and open now, now I'm in the channel settings for that reverb, right? So the first insert on that track is the reverb itself. Okay, might be a little mind bender right there. So I can take this further. I can send this reverb to another track if I wanted to, right? 
sometimes I, I, I love sending a reverb to a delay, for example, maybe something to try. Um, or you could do stuff like adding a an, an adding an EQ to the reverb or maybe getting rid of some frequencies before it enters the reverb. For example, I can say that I have no I have no point of uh, let me see if I can if I can learn this EQ. I just want to cut off Yes, yes, I don't want it to be dynamic, no. I don't want it to be linear. I want it to be cut, yes, there we go. So, I want to cut frequencies and I want to get rid of two, 250, 300. I like to do this on reverbs because I don't want those frequencies to affect the reverb, right? That's different than if I was to place an EQ after the reverb has done its thing. I'm hoping you, you can see the difference there, right? So the order of things does matter, but we're not going to pay too much attention to it at this point in your uh, music production journey if, if this is all very new. Just something to be aware of that the just like with a pedal board, the order does matter. <clears throat> okay. Very uh, happy to to see the your your comment secret. By the way, I was just <laughs> in the middle of explaining something. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, so far so good. That is sends versus inserts. Hopefully, that is uh, somewhat clear. I'd like to just show a couple of different types of reverbs. We've talked about convolution and uh, algorithmic, right? But I could also just as easily talk about a, a plate reverb, for example, this guy. And a plate reverb is like a, a big metal plate that reverberates. And so you, will, you would put the sound in on one side and measure the sound on the other side. And so it's obviously going to sound very metallic and, and a little bit bright. Right, let's see if we can find some. And it has uh, some gating inside there. <laughs> very funny. EMT large. Yeah, so this is going to sound different. It doesn't have that much boominess to it. Uh, and is it's often used on drums for that uh, reason. Okay. Um, what other things can we add? Uh, well, so we have a spring reverb. Um, <laughs> let's see if, if this guy is actually going to... Uh, yes, log me in. Thank you. I, I uh, have bought you. Yes, thank you. License. License detected. <laughs> Okay, so this also has lots of noise, uh, which some of these plugins have, and I don't understand necessarily why, but uh, there you go. So let me see if we can find, uh, so these have, these plugins have all, all sorts of uh, uh, specialized um, um, sound designery things. Let's see if we can find just a normal vintage vibe, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, so you can kind of hear a sort of a resonating reverb thingy. Uh, spring reverbs was uh, most often found in guitar amps. And it's an actually actual spring that will reverberate uh, a little bit in the same way as a plate reverb will. And so it has a very specific sound that uh, sounds great on guitar. Uh, but why don't try it on other things as well? Um, and that is it. That is it for reverbs. I'm not going to show too much more stuff. Um, we have <clears throat> lots of different effects that we could kind of show show off. Um, and we're going to do that. Um, yeah. 
So, but I, I would suggest you guys um, try out those key commands uh, that I talked about. So uh, I think that's going to make it a lot easier. So uh, again, I'm just going to add in a reverb that I know to, to make this quicker. Uh, so let's add in an echo boy uh, and say delay. And now I've added it to all of these tracks and by doing this, I can send to that <coughs> reverb and right, I can do that. I can also say, since this is on its own track, I don't need any of the dry information. Uh, so if some plugins still have part of the dry signal there, I usually move it to the to the wet wet side. All right, and this probably means that I will have to turn down the volume of the delay. Now I can do that in a couple of different ways, and it's not the same. So I can either turn down how much I'm sending to the delay box from each of these tracks. And that's going to make the unit behave a little bit differently because it's getting more audio in or less audio in. But I could also turn down the return volume, which is this fader right here, which is uh, conveniently colored purple. That isn't necessarily the same thing, though. Just just um, be aware of that because I'm, I'm now the the delay box is still getting as much sound into it as it was before. Um, but I'm just turning down the volume from the faders that are going out of that box. Okay. So but in, in this case, I'm going to do that. All right. So I'm just creating like a swamp of sound and uh, this sounds more like it's adding something to the reverb than than other things and with this, uh, the same way i can add in a an eq here as well and uh, right now i'm at it i added it after right or i could exaggerate that uh boominess if i wanted to Right, or I could clean it up with an EQ. So hopefully that comes through uh, on your end. Very nice, very nice. I think it's time for us to, we could talk about like different mm, plugins and stuff and uh, different tools. Um, I, I've written down like chorus, tremolo, auto pan, distortion, flanger, phaser, uh, and chorus. I'm, I might have said chorus twice. But I think um, we're going to move on to module five, the last module, which is going to be all about mixing. Before I do, I really need to go to the bathroom. So I'll just take a two minute break uh, and I'll be back. Uh, and we're going to we're going to mix this song. Um, and I'm going to talk while I do that. OK, sounds like a plan. I'll be I'll be back.
All right. All right. Last stretch. So let's talk about mixing. And let's talk about what it is, first of all. Um, I have mentioned this earlier in the course that I believe the mixing process is a very creative thing and uh, that we have a great responsibility once we start to mix something because it's on our shoulders to guide someone that's listening to the piece for the first time through the maze of all of the different tracks. I've read somewhere, don't quote me, that uh, we can kind of focus and, and listen to three, four elements at most at one time. And very often a mix has a lot more elements than that. So part of our job is to make the choice for the listeners, at least for when they're listening through the piece for the first time, kind of hold their hand in, in some kind of way. Um, and um, I think that's a great responsibility and and uh, I, I really like mixing. So, <laughs> so hopefully I can show you guys some things. Um, in this world, I, I really like to, I'm not gonna, not, not gonna switch yet. So I really like to separate being very analytical and, and um, create, creating order and the whole creative mixing part. I like to clean everything up, name it, make some kind of system, um, look at what I would need kind of get all my uh, ingredients ready before making dinner, um, that kind of a thing. So I'm going to show, talk about that first. And um, we're going to, we, we're going to create it from scratch for this mix. Then we're going to talk about templates, which, which uh, people who has been following the channel and uh, know, uh, know that I spend a lot of time on <laughs> um, and go from there. Okay. So Again, we've already added a couple of, uh, of channels and I actually like them to not be in this folder. So I just move them out of the folder. Uh, I'll hide this track because we're not using it. Already I have uh, added these folders. Folders in Cubase does not group the audio. Um, in Logic, you have something called track stacks, or in Pro Tools, uh, they've stolen that idea, so they have the same thing, but they call it something different. <clears throat> in Cubase, you're able to uh, do both separately, uh, which can be nice. So, all right, uh, for the rest, for example, in here, we have a lot of tracks that are not named properly. And we also have some rather um, disturbing four number thingy at the beginning. Uh, is there any way to get rid of that? Yes, I'll, I'll show you and you can just do the same thing as I do, all right? <clears throat> so let's go to a, uh, let's go to the project and project logical editor. Let's say meet name, name, uh, no, uh, media property, property is selected, event is selected. Okay, so that is our condition. I want to do this to the selected tracks. And then I would like to do this, replace search string. And no, I would not uh, do that. Um, replace generate name. I'm not even sure if I can do this. What I've done earlier is to um, uh, replace. So I guess I can do it this way. So just say that I would I would like to replace every zero with nothing. 
and I would like to replace every one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, it sort of worked. <laughs> so you could do one more and one more. Okay, and two. <laughs> Kind of need to click it a couple of times. Okay. I have to admit this is easier in Pro Tools. <clears throat> but there you go. So now I have a lot of uh, tracks with the same name, which I wouldn't be able to do in Pro Tools. Uh, but uh, here we can, which is great. But a lot of them are not descriptive. So the first thing I would like to go through and do is uh, to just name them. Very easy. So I'm just going to call this uh, a China symbol. Right? Uh, and go to the next one. I'm going to say uh, first uh, violin uh, flagellet, which I believe is the correct thing. Okay, first violin trem. Okay, and that is going to be uh, viola shorts. Cello pits, pizzicato. Okay, viola longs. It's nay should be beep, beep. Say second violin <laughs> longs. Yeah, I, I figured uh, you're talking about the pits. Okay, error message. Mm, let's just say viola again. I don't know, cello ish longs. Cello trem. Cello longs, definitely. And bases longs. Here we have flute. Yes, that would be nice. Uh, this is a bass flute. Woo. I always get uh, an oboe and cor anglais mixed up, but I'm pretty sure, knowing myself, that it's a cor, cor anglais. Oh. Okay. That's a piccolo. It's a very calm French horn, okay. So that needs to go up in volume. I'm already kind of moving it up just based on how it would sound orchestra-wise. Uh, what, what are you? Do you even have any information? You don't, then shift delete to delete the track. Mm -hmm. 
strings staccato. Okay, and this is um, call strings call latino. Uh, this I know what these kinds of sounds are because I do orchestral sampling thingy. If this is Greek again, don't just translate it to whatever you are mixing. String ensemble trem. Okay, this is uh, cello plus basses. Otva. Or I'm not sure what it's sure what it's called in English. Jingle bells, yes. And so we have, these are already panned, I believe. Yes. Uh, me trying to play guitar. And this is a tree chime. And the rivet symbol. Uh, this is okay. So there's a mistake here, but we we're gonna figure it out. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, this is a celeste, isn't it? Why do I have two celeste tracks then? Okay, we might have to skip the celeste thing because it's it's not working. Just gonna say Glock. I'm not entirely sure. I don't remember. Marimba. Okay, and yes, so it's not a Christmas Christmas thing without these uh, tubular bells. Very very Christmassy sound. So again, we have some. Uh, MIDI issues that are uh, present in these sounds, but we'll we'll do the best we can. And this is a xylophone. Okay, we have names for these. Uh, okay. I'm gonna delete that. I'm not sure if there was uh, some sound from the recording of if we wanted to have some Atmos in the in the thing. Moves well and stereo out this guy. As far as I can see, there is nothing here. So let's just get rid of it. Sub bass. Yes. Okay. We have. Oh. Vocals C, yes, this is, yes, we'll need to add uh, the vocals D sharp, we didn't end up using, uh, and neither did we with the Rhodes Mark 1. Harp Gliz. Yes, okay, great. So now we've named everything. That is an important step for me. Um, and I'm just gonna add very quickly, add the uh, reverb vocals to that one and also the delay, just so they're kind of at the same spot. All of those vocals, okay. Now I'm gonna do like a sorting. That's my next uh, kind of point. So I'm gonna start by moving, uh, and, and I'm gonna do this not the way I usually do it, but more of how I would do a pop track. And the way I would do that is I would start with the drums. So I'm gonna add the percussion and the drums at the top. All right. <clears throat> which means that I'll also do all of these melodic percussion, <clears throat> the low swell and the shaker 
shakers. Uh, I think that is mostly it. Yes, let's move you guys up. And again, let's do symbol shaker things that are not tonal at the very top. Like so. Now <clears throat> I could add a folder and I'm probably I'm going to do that. Let's say percussion. And then for all of these, another folder that says melodic percussion. And now your folders will be different and that's fine. Um, but cool to kind of have a system. Uh, okay, strings, strings, strings. strings. Okay. Are there more strings? Yes, there are. Uh, beautiful. There's another choir that I've forgotten. Beautiful. And you are strings. Flute and piccolo. There we go. You guys are going to be wood winds. And we have one folder for brass. And we have acoustics. We have the choir, which I'm going to add the correct settings to uh, delay. Boom, boom. And this choir is kind of doing that sort of a thing. So it's not going to supposed to be high in the mix, but uh, I still want it there. And then we have uh, some synth stuff and we have sub bass and harp glist is actually going to go into the strings folder in my book cool and to be honest we can move delete that the rest folder <laughs> uh, great now uh, we've named it and we've sorted it from, from top to bottom. Um, my next point is probably going to be to uh, group them. Let's group them. And again, I'm going to use the key command now, uh, which in my case is Control-Alt-Shift-G for a group track. What a group track does is it says the output of all of these individual tracks are going to go to this one track, which enables me to, for example, put one EQ on the group track that will affect every track that sends its audio to that group track, which helps me work in, in larger um, pencils, pencil strokes. Is that the way you say it in English? I'm not sure. Um, but it enables me to very quickly change the sound and work uh, on a on a bigger level or on a macro level and on a micro level so i can work within one group and then what does that group sound like in the in the grand scale of the mix kind of so i'm going to say uh, percussion and i say lvl for level um at the end and i, I say create outside folder because i, I want to sort them myself <clears throat> okay good Okay, and now that is done, I'm just going to drag it down to the bottom. Uh, where am I? Not yet. Let's keep it in the same folder. <laughs> Can't decide. Because we're going to color them, so it's easier to, to wait a little bit with moving them. So again, I'm going to do the same. Again, melodic percussion perk level. <clears throat> Open up the strength folder and do the same here strings level same here woodwinds level little abbreviation and even though it's only one track I'm still doing it just for uh, consistency's sake and and um, who knows suddenly there's gonna be more brass. Uh, so I'm just doing this because I wanna be done with all, the, all of the cleaning before I start the mixing process. Okay, acoustic, uh, I'm just gonna say guitar level. And then uh, we're gonna say 
sin level. Sub base level. And for the big one, vocals level. Great. And now I'm just going to choose some colors. And in my setup, there's a lot of different colors. And uh, this is this is only because I, I've bought some other uh, third party stuff. And so let's do it the way I usually do it. So the vocals will be very orange. And I'll actually uh, do this deep orange. How about that? Great. Sub base will be something red. And I'm going to start moving these group tracks outside as well. Very good. And so I'm closing you. And here is the synth folder. It's also going to be uh, red ish. Very nice. Uh, again, yes, that's good. Guitar level. Guitar is always yellow in my book for some reason. Uh, I forgot to move you out. There we go. Brass is light blue. And talking about colors and sound, there's a lot of interesting things we can we can talk about. Come on. Um, woodwinds are going to be like a brown. Do we have a brown? Brown. Oh, but it's more, it's more of, let's do that. Fine. Strings are going to be green, a darker green. Melodic perk. Now you are going to be brown. And last percussion. I'm going to be uh, like a purple. Now, would you look at this? Beautiful. We're almost done. Uh, we're going to create a folder called effects and all of these are going to be something very 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 cyan like so and all of these will be group tracks and sometimes i even use this little feature that we talked about earlier and have these in its own separate space at the top uh, so now what I'm going to do is even add in these reverb, um, reverb returns and have them on their own, uh, re uh, like group track. So I can do that and say FX level and have that be the same cyan color and move it into the group tracks folder. So now everything in the session, some way or another, comes through one of these tracks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten tracks. So that's a lot less. And but we're not going to stop there. I'm going to do something called a sub master, which I'm going to color very red. And. Another that that one sends out to, which is also going to be red. Okay. What on earth is the point of this? Now, if I go into the mixer, for example, I can I can choose to show by by clicking one of these buttons. I can choose to only see group tracks. For example, and now all I see is these group, tra group tracks that I've already made, which is helpful. I can also choose 
uh, I can, if I want, I can add that as a configuration and say group tracks. Um, I can choose to only show the effects channels and say effects channels. Or I could say only show audio channels. Now, very easily, I can switch between these views, which is very helpful. Okay. In addition, I, I've, I've got this system here. So submaster and output. What is the point of that? For example, I've deleted it now. No, I haven't deleted it. I've just hidden it. So I have this master clock track, which is already mixed. And what if I wanted to listen to this in comparison to what I've done with this track here? After a while, we're going to end up with maybe a couple plugins on the output, uh, on the on the master track itself. And if I played back this track that was already mixed through this, those same plugins, then it wouldn't same it wouldn't sound the way it should. <clears throat> So I have one extra kind of line of defense uh, in, in my setup so that I'm able to say, I want this master clock track to send to the output so that I can add whatever I want on this track without it affecting uh, me when I'm playing back this track. Okay, so that is my whole point uh, there. <clears throat> now, there's not too many steps left before I'm ready to mix, but there is one step that I really like to do, which is this. If we go to audio and go to advanced, detect silence. And I need to select something to do that. Audio. Advanced detect silence. So I can do it um, all in one go, which I am going to in Cubase. That's very nice, very nice of Cubase. Audio, advanced, detect silence. And I'm going to say I want the threshold to be almost like infinity. Uh, so you can copy my settings if, you, if you'd like. And I'm just going to say uh, 250. And 250. I'm also going to say 250 here and 250 here. I just want to be uh, certain that I'm not deleting something I wouldn't want to, um, something that has audio in it that I'm going to use. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying only delete stuff if there's absolutely no sound. And the only reason that works in this case is that I, I know I've been using mostly software instruments to make this. And so I know there's going to be a, a, a complete silence in, in some parts. Okay, so I want to strip the silence. I want to process all selected events and do the auto thingy. And I'm going to say compute. Great, and then process. <coughs> and now it's doing its thing. And it looks like this now, which is really great. It's really great because now we might have some some small stuff to clean up, but a lot of the job is already made for us now. And to me, this looks a lot cleaner and enables me to very easily see what is playing at uh, the specific times. Okay. Very nice. Let's get to mixing. <clears throat> Well, for for the uh, choir stuff, I'm actually going to just go straight to the vocals level. And uh, the great thing about Cubase is I can actually solo the group track and it will 
automatically solo the, the tracks that are sending to that group track. So very easily, I can add a uh, an EQ. Just say I don't want anything below uh, 100, maybe. <laughs> like to just control the dynamics a little bit at the end there because there's some things that kind of poke out and I might go in and adjust them um, uh, individually <laughs> Uh, voices that are very 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 much too loud so let's try to look at them there they were and I know I've mixed it this way because I wanted that uh, that those notes to, to come through all right cool I also know that I want to do something uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait a little bit with that <laughs> such a tease all right so that is um, most of the vocal things done I'll have a listen to the beginning <laughs> Um, I'm just going to move upwards um, and, and work my way. Um, I usually go wherever my ear take me at this point, uh, which is a really nice way to work. So now I'm, I'm starting the creative process. So I'm, I'm, I'm adding a little bit of distortion, uh, which, which in turn will add a little bit, uh, a, lot, a lot of um, overtones, which will make it cut through in the mix a little bit easier. Bounce kick, hello, I am good. I've been streaming for almost seven hours now and my voice is breaking, but <laughs> there, you, there you go. So uh, I'm reala realizing that these are pretty similar. So what I'm gonna do is just copy the settings over and see how close that is getting me. Um, this is the Diva pad and you can do that by just clicking at the inserts and dragging it over. So. <laughs> We like the diva, and so a little bit of the same stuff for the um, for the sub. Um, 
Bounce Kick says, currently working on a remix. Can't find a way to clean up a cello melody. It's too uh, buzzy. What could I use? Like the zzz, like the wasp kind of sound. I would uh, I would use a deesser or try a deesser. Either that or just rolling off the top end. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, again use a couple of uh, trusted trusted tools. Um, ah, yes, baby. Yes, I think I like the Ampeg best. This is the Ampeg, the A. And again, we're gonna keep some of the same settings. Uh, I know I, I could add like stuff like this sub synth. Uh, and uh, you need to be careful about these things. So I'm. I'm not not going to show too much of it. <laughs> I'm just trying to work a little quickly. So there you go. Uh okay, and I think it's good, but it's just a little loud. So I could either turn up or down the gain on the region. That is not the same as turning up or down the Fader. We talked about the signal chain and the way, um, the order of things, and the gain for the region it happens before everything else. So um, that is something to keep in mind when you're doing stuff like this. For the acoustic, I am going to add a. Oops. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I'm going to add a uh, an effect. We're going to call it uh, guitar plate. I think that would be really nice. Uh, let's try that EMT thing. Um, where was it? Arturia. Reverb. Re reverb plate. I would like you to go to effects level. So you already have done that. Uh, where did you go? Did you go here? It's called guitar plate. Let's find it by hitting control F guitar plate. Where are you? There you are. And we've just hidden you because I forgot to uncheck that we don't want you in that folder. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So we have the acoustics right here. We're going to go to the mixer, open up the sends, and turn it up. Hmm, okay. There we go. So we now have, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of a reverb. Let's do a large plate. No, it's way too boomy. Um. That's better. I like that better. Um, not not so uh, so boomy. Still, I'm gonna just add in a an EQ. And for all of these, I'm just going to add the delay uh, as well. Because 
I'm playing very little and I kind of want the delay to take over and uh, bridge the transitions. <laughs> Did work, didn't it? Yeah. Might have to go into the Echo Boy and kind of open it up a little bit. And that's not easy when you're working with the Space Echo, so. <laughs> okay, let's just keep it the way it is then. The way it is. Uh, what am I doing? This French horn needs to go up. Uh, a lot in volume. Let's play that again. Sub is way too loud. Uh, boom, 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 boom. And for all of these orchestral things, I'm just gonna use something that I always use, right? Don't, don't think too much about it. I'm gonna use this guy. I'm gonna not create it inside the folder, and we're gonna do that, and I'm gonna say VSS3. Great, and you've seen this before. <clears throat> Large warm hole is the one I want. And so everything is now set up to, to send to that reverb, but it doesn't send to that reverb automatically, which is the way I like it. Maybe I would like... to just control this part a little bit. It's not the sub, but it's you. It's you that are the problem. Turn back the mix knob a little bit as well there. So I'm, I'm working quickly now, but hopefully uh, you can rewind if this is uh, too quick. There will be some learning to be had from this. Thanks for thanks for sticking with me so so long. I'm, I'll I'll be done soon. <laughs> okay, so this guy, I love that little part. Finding some some trouble frequencies, um, and for this guy, also adding a lot of reverb, 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 reverb. Okay, let's see if we can uh, add in a little bit of top. Or he's had a little bit. something like that 
Boom, boom. Help of the word TV. Thanks for following. Yes, we have something after this. Yes, we have. So I'm gonna. Yes, I want a little bit of that sizzle at the end there. Okay, for you, um, again, uh, as you guys can see, uh, uh, the, the tool that I use the most is probably the EQ, right? I'm, I'm molding the sound. And I kind of want to see if I can get a little bit more punch. definition right so the the s actual tone of it the punch and the definition is what I wanted right there okay ah, that's fine so a lot of these are already obviously have already all obviously been uh, treated uh, because they're sample libraries. Okay, but this guy I want to do something cool with. So I want to do a transient shaper, uh, transient master, or transient shaper. We'll do, we'll do this guy. Okay, and for better or for worse, we'll, we'll only use the uh, Steinberg uh, stock compressor right now. But we will open up the attack. Which is basically what that other plugin is doing as well. So I'm just doing it in small steps. <clears throat> And this is probably the part where I can start to cheat a little and try to create a little bit more of a uh, stereo image of things. So although uh, these uh, samples are recorded in situ, which means that they uh, sit where the orchestra, where in the orchestra positions and therefore are panned that way, I kind of want to separate them anyways because I, I break 100 rules about orchestration in this piece anyways. So there you go. Okay. And let's just have a little listen at the rest of the strings at the end here. All right, I'm just gonna add a little bit more reverb to the string uh, bus. And that one of the trims. I just want to kind of fade it naturally. So I'm going to fade it and then double click the fade and then do one of these. So I'm just uh, creating a sl like a shape for the fade. It looks like this. And now 
get more of a natural uh, fade together with the other instruments. <laughs> I still have my wife's uh, voice in my left ear. Let's try to localize. have a little little thing that we need to fix that is actually wrong with the audio file for the uh, uh, melodic percussion here right here it's cut off so we need to be a little cheeky about that track do something like that and it's, it's more or less fixed so I added a lot of reverb and then added the fade uh, at the other end, which often helps. So the same there. This is just me not being quick, uh, being a little bit too quick when preparing for tonight. This project has already been mixed for when it when uh, it actually was a job, <laughs> so. Okay, for this guy, I'm gonna try to uh, make it a little drier. There's some mistakes here, very clearly, in the MIDI, so we can't have it too loud in the mix. Same here. So again, we're adding an octave there from, from uh, the um, woodwinds. Okay, this guy. Let's try the guitar plate. Need to go down a lot. Like the stuff like the tree chime or the jingle bells that like, they will cut through everything listen still hear it same with you let's do the same guitar plate thingy This is not supposed to be here. It should, yes, it is. It's a rivet symbol. Um, I'm just gonna turn it down a little bit. Okay. Just gonna move it a little bit. Do. 
So a little bit of the same thing here, just fading it a little bit, doing that. Ah, there we go. Okay, let's listen to this. <laughs> Just gonna add this slowly. Fade in. Better. Last thing I'm going to do is actually automate a little thing here. And it's as simple as what I did now. So I'm just drawing in um, ways that the program is going to behave over time. So I wanted to turn off the reverb uh, because the vocals are um, sticking around too long. And I need to move it, which I can do this way. Okay. Very nice. Um, and that is basically how I would do a simple mix like this. I believe. Let me look at my notes and see uh, what we've kind of um, skipped and how important it is. Yes, we can talk a little bit about how I would send this off and maybe master it. Like uh, most of this stuff isn't mastered, um, like media music, but if I was to master it, I would just slap a little, like a. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to show you what I use and not matter too, and not be too worried about it because you can just use a lot of different tools, but I'm just working faster this way. So um, I would add some way of kind of opening up things a little bit um, and then a limiter. Maybe a clarifonic because I love it, and just use a preset. Oops, I hate that I can't scroll in this mix. I just want mix buzz air. Thank you. Maybe turn it down a little bit, and then just have a look at what the limiter tells me. see that I'm listening to double volume right now because it shouldn't sound anywhere close to as loud as it does so let me just figure out why and it's because I'm hearing double <laughs> there we go so now uh, or did I just mute you guys it's late yes I just muted you guys and I really shouldn't be hearing things double. But maybe a 
settle for some like right now we we have lots of room to raise the volume without uh without losing any dy dynamics so i'm just doing that and that's why it's probably a little loud for you guys let's let's have a look yes, it's already compressing for what i'm sending to you guys so just be aware of that This would probably be my out point. And then I'll just go here, recording techniques, um, mixing example version one. And then I would export that, and that looks like this. <coughs> Easiest pie. And if we now have a look at that uh, file, let's have a look. Here it is. And it looks like this. So you can see that we haven't really mastered it super hard. Um, but this would be perfect for um, the case use and the material. Uh, so we still have a lot of dynamics left. Uh, but we can also be safe that we're not losing lots of dynamics <clears throat> by doing it this way. Okay. Whew. We've now been streaming for seven hours, and that's uh, been pretty a pretty long stream. I've been talking nonstop uh, and teaching. So it's been awesome to uh, finally go through this as a way for me to say thanks for uh, reaching a thousand subscribers on YouTube. I'm very, very thankful and honored uh, that people want to watch what I have to say. So um, I am now going to go to sleep and teach for all of tomorrow. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And I'll see you guys very soon. <laughs> Thanks for watching. And